fine gallery of uh, pictures that I see on my screen here of uh, people from the far corners of the earth, as, as you might say. So uh, it's wonderful to, to have. Well, I'd like to welcome everyone to uh, the uh, September, the first session of the September ISBA uh, CAG virtual meeting. Uh, including all of, of you uh, CAG representatives and official observers, of course. Also want to uh, recognize, acknowledge uh, being with us, Dr. Stavros uh, Tamadakis, the ISB board chair, and the deputy chair, Carolyn Lee. Uh, also for the first time, and he, he just interjected a moment ago, so you can recognize him, he's on his iPhone. Dr. Yu, if I can pronounce it correctly, Yu uh, Shen, who is observing this meeting for the PIOB. And uh, a special welcome to a new uh, CAG representative, uh, Mr. Akihito Ishiwata, who is replacing Takeshi Harai as the new representative uh, for our IOSCO, uh, Mr. Ishi. Wada is the Deputy Chief Accountant of Corporate Accounting and Disclosure Division, Policy and Markets Bureau of the Financial Services Agency of Japan. Also would like to welcome uh, Mr. Juan Carlos Serrano, who is representing the World Bank uh, for this meeting as Zio Mara Morel is unable to attend with us. I'd also like to take this opportunity to bid a uh, fond farewell, even though he's not on the call with us. Uh, the following, uh, as I mentioned, uh, Takeshi Harai had represented IASCO in the past. He uh, was working with Japan's FSA and represented IASCO on the CAG from 2018 through 2021. He's recently returned. Uh, to his previous uh, firm, PwC Japan, after he had completed his uh, term with the FSA. We appreciate his contribution over the years on the CAG, including on the, the membership panel that we have. Uh, also, uh, we'll recognize right now uh, the presenters that we'll have for this first day, Brian Friedrich, uh, an ASBA uh, board member, and he's chairing the uh, working the technology working group. Rich Huskin, uh, a uh, ASBA board member, and chairs the technology task force. And Jen Paul, uh, our first presenter, uh, a board member, and he chairs the tax planning task force. Uh, a special thank you for all of the task forces and, and staff for their hard work in putting together the materials for the meeting. And just a, a protocol for reminder, if you're not speaking, please make sure that your microphone is on mute, especially with so many people on the, on the call. And if you wish to make a, uh, a comment, uh, if you can use the, the raised hand function, and they've, they've moved that. Uh, it's under the reactions uh, icon on your, uh, on your screen. So that's where you'll find that. And once after you're finished talking, if you'd please lower your hand by clicking that once again, and it'll, it'll, and then place yourself back on mute. So the first order of business is uh, we have some draft minutes from the March uh, CAG meeting. Uh, that were, were distributed to everybody. As I understand, there were a couple minor changes and Diane uh, Vesquez or, or from the staff is gonna, uh, Diane is gonna uh, read those comments. I'll, that, I'll read them out in fact. Carolyn. You're, you're gonna um, do that, Jeff. Okay, yeah, we, We've you. sent a marked up copy uh, for agenda item A1, but since then we've received a couple of minor um, changes from uh, the SEC staff. Uh, who were of course the presenters uh, for the last uh, for the March meeting and this is agenda uh, C on page five um, the a third bullet point there um, at the bottom there um, the second last line instead of necessarily uh, we're just amending it to also um, and again um, uh, the next set of bullet points are the second bullet points of the next set of bullet points um, and on the 
on the fourth uh, line there, instead of independence, uh, we're changing it to objectivity and impartiality. Uh, and those were the only additional changes that um, you wouldn't have had the chances to see. Hey, Thanks, thank Galen. you. Thank you, Jeff. And, and so uh, unless there's anything else, uh, uh, these will be, uh, unless anybody chimes in with a raised hand uh, with changes, uh, we'll accept those as presented. And I don't see any. Thank you. Uh, so the draft, uh, and then we also have draft minutes for the May meeting, and I don't believe there was any changes to those. And again, unless there's anyone that had anything at this time, we'll approve those as, as presented. Thank you. With that, then the uh, the first presentation, or well, I, I'll mention what we're going to hear today. Uh, we have two days of IESBA uh, CAG sessions all together today and then again on September 20th. And then tomorrow we have a, a joint uh, uh, IAASB and ISBA uh, CAG session on the PI project. Uh, today we'll receive the presentation, uh, presentation on tax planning and related services uh, from the working group and a final their final report and recommendations to the IESBA. And, uh, uh, and then following that, an update uh, from the technology working group's activities since March, including its non-authoritative guidance material or NAM. And then we'll also have an update from the technology task force proposed technology related revisions to the code. And that will be an opportunity for all of us to provide their feedback before the task force looks to the board for approval of the proposed text for exposure in December. And then uh, before moving into that first presentation, there's a, a bit of an update uh, from uh, Ken Siong the uh, senior technical director of uh, IESBA on the quality uh, management conforming amendments project. So Ken, you can take it from here. Thank you, Galen, and uh, good morning, good afternoon, good evening, everyone. Uh, uh, my update is gonna be quite brief. Uh, it is really to inform the CAG that IESBA approved uh, at the June meeting, uh, a set of conforming amendments to the code arising from the finalization of the IWSB's quality management standards, uh, principally, principally ISQM1 and ISQM2. The, uh, really, it, it, that was a very uh, limited scope project. Um, the intent was to align um, certain terms and uh, concepts that are in the code uh, as, as used in ISQ, uh, in particular ISQC1, um, the former ISQC1, which, is, uh, which, which has now been replaced by ISQM1. So uh, the board approved those conforming amendments. Really, they were uh, about alignment of certain terms in the code um, to the same terms that are used or the corresponding terms that are used in ISQM1. Uh, for example, terms like quality control um, now are referred to as quality management in ISQM1. Uh, and also ISQM1, for example, refers to the design, uh, implementation, and operation of a system of quality management. Uh, so with extended uh, terminology along the same lines in the code. Uh, there have also been one or two alignments to concepts that are now in ISQM1. Uh, concepts like um, uh, reasonable assurance really are now directed only at the system of quality management as a whole, as opposed to in the individual elements or components of, of the quality control system and the former SQC1. So the board approved those conforming amendments. Really, they are strictly alignment changes uh, as we coordinated with uh, the IWSB, we received some input from uh, IWSB staff, um, which we considered at the level of our task force. Uh, and uh, some of those, uh, some of the comments that were raised with us, uh, we and the board felt were more substantive in nature. So the board asked uh, the engagement uh, team who brought its independence task force to consider uh, those more substantive comments because some of those comments appear to relate to the definition of um, audit team, uh, which is being considered in that project. 
So that task force engagement team for bodies task force will consider those, uh, it has been considering those changes and will come to the board um, in December with some proposed proposals as to whether there are, uh, there is need for any changes to the board. So these are more substantive changes again um, uh, that the board decided not to uh, address as part of the conforming amendments because um, uh, again to re reiterate the, uh, that conforming amendments project really was um, uh, not addressing substantive matters uh, that would need um, further board deliberation. Uh, the exposure draft is out now for comment. Uh, it will close in early October and the board will consider the significant comments um, on the exposure draft at its December board, me board meeting. The intent is to have the board consider any revisions to those proposed changes and approve them in uh, the December board meeting. Uh, we need intent to have the same effective date for those conforming amendments as ISQM1 and ISQM2 as, as appropriate. So that's where we are at the moment, um, Galen. Uh, it really is just for the CAC's information. Yeah. Um, uh, as I say, any, any, any matters of substance will, will be, um, uh, we will have an opportunity to uh, bring them to the CAG as part of the normal process of developing substantive changes to the code. So I'll pause here, Galen, and uh, you know, if any CAG representative has any comments, more than welcome to address them. Thank you, uh, thank you, Ken. So with that, then uh, we'll we'll move forward to our first uh, agenda uh, uh, item, and uh, Jen Paul, uh, the uh, uh, working group uh, chair of the tax planning related services, uh, turn the time to you for your presentation. Thank you, Galen, and good morning, good afternoon, good evening to everyone. I'm happy to present our final report to you and our um, project proposal. So on the next slide, you will see the objective of the session. Um, it is to receive um, final report and recommendation of the tax planning and related services working group and to consider and approve a project proposal. This is um, at the, on the agenda of uh, the September board meeting. So um, after some uh, time lost uh, because of uh, difficulties we had to make all our outreach activities and on the other hand to set some priorities to NAS and fee project, to the NAS and the fee project, we are finally not far behind our original schedule and we are uh, in the status of uh, hopefully uh, approving this final report and um, to approve also in the same board meeting um, our project proposal. And by that, um, I think we are quite good in our timing ambitions. Um, on the next slide, um, a short, uh, uh, summary of the agenda of the session, I will try to, to recap, make a recap from the May CAC meeting and then repeat uh, some options we have discussed in the May meeting and between May and now. Um, and I would like to present the rationale for the working group recommendations and to, to um, explain to you the project proposal its objectives, the focus and scope. And then in more detail, uh, some first thoughts on a principle-based framework for tax planning, ethical in impacts of tax planning, and then the plan for stakeholder consultation as a task force if the board agrees, and then also to, to, to show the public interest framework alignment and finally, a quite ambitious project timeline. So I will start with a recap from the May 2021 meeting, where we discussed the preliminary report. And um, you have seen uh, the agenda papers B1. Um, there is no big change between the preliminary report and the nearly final report you are seeing in front of you. Um, we, we are recommending to go uh, beyond 
um, non-authoritative uh, material um, and we are proposing to develop standards and um, so we want to highlight that um, IESPA is taking here a role and um, because of also the public uh, 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 interest importance um, and the board has also agreed during our discussion in, in, in June, this approach. Um, we have to look at the global developments and also in the last few months, the, the, the tax um, discussions, and you can also say the progress of a global OECD G7 and G20 approach towards more transparency, fairness and accountability on the one hand, but also the ECG, the environmental social governance discussions which are also quite closely connected with um, the tax planning uh, uh, item uh, have progressed. So there is a public expectation, there are global development and we get a quite um, encouraging support by stakeholders, mm -hmm. not only from this group, but also from the NSS and um, GPPC and PAOs. So we are now in the position that we had also some some um, outreach activities in the very last few months um, where, we, where we supported to, to, to go in this direction, even though there are um, different views sometimes in the, how to say, priority. NAM first, then uh, looking on enhancement of the code or the other way around. So, and you see here the options, you know them all um, on the next slide. Where we, um, which we have discussed with each, each and every um, stakeholder we were uh, discussing. Uh, option A, to develop uh, overarching material in part one of the code that will assist PAs comply with the fundamental principles and apply the conceptual framework. And option B, uh, which has not uh, received much support is de to develop material under one or more specific fundamental principle and the option C to develop material outside of the code itself. So th that's the NAM proposal uh, on the types and magnitude of threats that are created in the tax planning um, uh, arena. On the next slide, um, I will try to, to explain um, a little bit the res rationale of, of um, our um, recommendations. Um, the rationale is that um, there is an overarching, um, on an overarching level, um, the, the, the necessity uh, to, to look and to, to see the linkages of the provision of the code um, on the one side and to, to, to make it more visible and understandable for professional in the context of tax planning services. So it is about the um, PA's role, um, uh, for example, to, to, to support sustainability of businesses and the profession's reputation at large in the context of public perception and expectation. So in this regard, um, we see um, that there is room for an, analyze, an analysis of reputational risks um, from the profession's perspectives. And um, it is clear that we don't want um, to see the item of tax morality as a priority. However, we see the necessity that IESPA is taking a leadership role and to make um, authoritative guidance um, on a principle-based and clear um, focus on the so-called gray area of tax planning from an ethical perspective. And um, by that, we, we see room um, and 
also the public interest is, is uh, reflecting here um, an action and activity by the board. So we see uh, here the priority in standard setting because um, I guess there is a standard setting board. We are not saying at that stage that is up to the task force that we need many uh, requirements here. Um, from, from our discussions on the working group level, we see more uh, need of application material in the code where a lot of examples are uh, con concerning uh, accounting and audit services, but very uh, limited um, explanation, explanatory uh, and, and application material on, on tax activities of professional accountant in business and in uh, public practice. Um, we are looking uh, for a unifying framework because we have uh, seen through our outreach activities a lot of different approaches in different jurisdictions. And by that, we think it is appropriate to look at these good examples from national level or regional level and to consolidate them somehow on global level. And I mentioned um, earlier the ECG developments. And as you all know, sustainable taxation is one of uh, key priorities also after COVID crisis recovery. And uh, we also see this linkage between our project and the ECG agenda. So um, on the next slide, uh, you will see the working group recommendation, which says that the board undertake a project to develop enhancements to the code to address ethical consideration when PABs and PAPPs provide tax planning services. I would like now to, to, to look a little bit more deeply to the project proposal, which is agenda item 9b. So the objectives and the focus and the scope. Um, the objective is to um, develop a principle-based framework to guide PA's conduct when providing tax planning and uh, related services to employing organizations and clients and at the same time, it, the code should, should be robust and um, relevant too. And so we see this as a very important uh, part um, of public trust uh, in the global um, accountancy profession. I think it's not necessary to repeat what you can read in, in, in our a report on the developments and scandals and, and discussions on regional and global level in the last three or four years. So um, I think it's quite important and we get enormous support by stakeholders. Um, they said that it is a good approach that IESPA is taking this on board and shows that um, ethics and tax planning is an issue which we will um, have um, a special focus on. The scope uh, will be um, on part two and three. I will come to this later, PABs and PPPs, P P A P P. sorry. Um, the um, provisions to which we want to develop will be scalable across individual and corporate tax players, uh, payers and from small to bigger companies. Um, so SMEs, publicly traded uh, multinational entities. So the scope will be broad. Um, and it is about the PA's um, responsibilities um, when they encounter um, cir circumstances involving uh, actual or suspected unlawful 
tax evasion. This is addressed under NOCLA. So NOCLA is not our primer uh, uh, focus, but in developing the project, um, it is probably uh, appropriate to give reference to the NOCLA um, provisions. Um, perhaps on the next slide, you can see um, the uh, objective I mentioned, um, the focus. So we will not um, analyze merits of any particular tax positions, tax schemes or tax regimes. We are also not judging about different jurisdictions and their approaches. So we recognize that there is a competition between jurisdictions, that's a fact, and we are not judging on that. Um, but the, these are, uh, this is the environment in which a professional accountant is acting. So we, we will look, if the board agrees, um, we'll look at part two and part three and to enhancements to part one. So that uh, will be the main um, focus. Um, on the next slide, um, we, have, we, we have tried in our uh, project proposal and in our um, final report to, to describe a little bit um, how a principle-based framework might be looking like. So the broad objective is, as I mentioned, to guide PAs in making ethical judgments and decisions in the context of tax planning and related services, either to the employing organizations or to clients. We discussed during the last CAC uh, meeting the terminology issue. So we have not solved the terminology issue and probably no one is able to solve the terminology uh, issue uh, in a, in a uh, proper manner. But um, we explained to you and we discussed this also with the board that um, we would uh, go for an acceptable or unacceptable um, um, tax planning behavior as a working title. But one of the objectives of the task force is also to look at a proper definition and terminology. So we would not like to uh, decide this as a working group because it's up to the task force when starting drafting and consultation on that to find the proper terminology. So it is one focus also um, of the, that task force. But more importantly, I think it's important to, to, to address cir circumstances where there might be undue pressure to recognize the inducement uh, which might be offered to achieve certain tax outcomes. Um, we, we would like to provide guidance on when uh, communication with those charged with governance and management is appropriate and um, to provide also guidance when and with whom to consult internally or externally. Another important um, item um, will be a consideration about transparency on the one side and um, the duty of confidentiality under the code on the other side. There is uh, the need for a balance and we, uh, we recommend to the board to take this also as part of the project proposal. And then last but not least, also to address documentation expectations for um, professional um, accountants. The task force will then, next slide please, uh, have a broad stakeholder consolidation, uh, consultation. The next slide please. Um, with you, the CAG, but also with regulators. No, no, the last, the previous slide please, thank you. Um, regulators in the G20 jurisdictions. 
please go to the formal slide, go back. Thank you. To the national standard setters. I, I think we're on the next slide. There we go. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> um, with IFAC, and you all know the IFAC um, um, material for professional organizations on tax planning issues. We have carefully studied this and had also outreach activities with IFAC. So we will continue this uh, communication and it's PAEB and SMP advisory groups. Uh, we are planning um, to, 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 or recommending to have stakeholder consolidation, especially with OECD. You probably remember at the working group, we started this consultation and we will then far in the project um, uh, have, would like to get feedback also from OECD, investors, preparers and government communities. And also POEs, accountancy firms, but also academia and the legal profession. That was something we discussed during our last CAC meeting, but also at board level, because there is an issue of uh, competition with uh, the legal profession always um, um, arguing with their legal um, privilege, which is an issue we would like to look at, also understand, because we have heard from lawyers that there is also in the legal profession uh, a changing view on uh, aggressive tax activities. And as we have heard from some jurisdictions, even lawyers are um, there under very, very intensive criticism of um, uh, having had uh, not appropriate behavior, ethical behavior toward some tax playing uh, structures. And last but not least, also the academia um, we want to include. The PIOB on the next slide has uh, uh, highlighted and uh, emphasized that we also should look uh, for alignment, uh, alignment with the public interest framework. So that's why we, we, we have, uh, put together some, some thoughts on this public interest framework. Um, the objective, the key outcomes to be sought is uh, to promote consistent um, tax planning behavior and practice. We would like to raise the awareness about risk to employing organizations, clients, and the profession. And we want to promote fairness, accountability, and transparency the transparency of the ECG imperatives. Um, the scope is broad and scalable. So it is to uh, professional accountant and business and public practice are scoped in. And we are looking to SMPs and also large global networks. Um, the, the, the tax planning is um, uh, uh, not only looking at corporates from SMP, SMEs to global national entities, listed entities, but also individual tax player, uh, taxpayer clients and who will be the beneficiaries, uh, who is this, uh, 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 the, the, the um, public or the people for whom we want to develop this. So first it's for the profession, but also the beneficiary will be the investors, taxpayers, standard setters, national standard setters, tax authorities, preparers, those charged with governance and policy makers, but the global accountancy profession has a huge interest um, on uh, this subject. And uh, public resources and society at large. So that's, uh, in a nutshell, our project uh, proposal to develop in the code requirements, application materials, clear definitions, and um, guidance under a principle-based 
framework. On the next slide, um, we have um, drawn a um, um, prelim preliminary timeline, especially also recognizing that um, POB has, uh, in the last public interest matters uh, uh, pronouncement, uh, emphasized um, the timing um, for the project. So if the board will approve the project proposal in this month, we would like to update, um, um, the task force would like to update um, the board uh, the December meeting on uh, first thoughts and, and issues and discuss issues with IESPA and the CAC in March next year. In June, we would like to uh, discuss further issues and prepare for September a first read of proposals. And um, if this is all going in this direction, we are quite, quite ambitious and would like to approve an ED in December 2022. And then you see the, the following timeline update in June 2023, full review of the ED sponsors in September and approval of final pronouncement in December 2023. On the next slide, some questions to you. Um, I'm happy to discuss each and every um, point I mentioned and um, also questions to uh, the final report and um, the uh, project proposal. But are there any other substantive matters that should be included or further discussed in the project proposal? And are there any other general or specific comments relating to the final report or the project proposal? So that is my presentation and I'm looking forward to discussion with you. Thank you, Galen. Uh, Galen, you're on mute. There we go. I apologize. So thank you, Jens, uh, for that presentation. I'll, I'll, I'll lead with uh, just a couple uh, straightforward questions and invite uh, representatives to raise their hands as well. Uh, for, for first of all, Jens, is there going to be any any focus on, uh, or will there be a distinction between PI and non-PI as we go forward because of you know the PI project is out there? Uh, do you see any any uh, uh, divisions there as far as uh, the, the the project as it goes? as you're proposing it. And also in, the, in our last CAG meeting, we had uh, some discussions about tran transactions and transactional nature of, of what we're dealing with here. Will it address things like tax structuring, uh, different types of entities, uh, tax havens, uh, th those sorts of things? Uh, maybe you could just comment on that. And, and please representatives, if you have questions, comments, please raise your hands. Sure, Gail, I, I will respond to your two uh, questions. Um, there is, at that stage, um, we, we, we as a working group are seeing it not only as a pie, uh, a division of pie and non-pie in principle, as a division, that this is necessary. It might be in the in the a factor, perhaps in the public perception. So, as a factor, which may may have some relevance, but um, we have not yet any indication heard that there is a principal division between pi and non pi. And if you perhaps look at the NAS project, where we have introduced. Um, one tax planning uh, promoting um, paragraph, you can say, uh, we have also no distinction between pi and non-pi. That is just an a, a, a observation. But 
um, we have not yet discussed this and as a principle based approach we would like to have, I would say that pi non pi might be a factor on the public perception of certain activities, but the ethical framework will be the same. But perhaps the safeguards or the actions which are necessary um, may be different. For example, if you have a PI, you have those charged with governance to communicate with, and perhaps in a non-PI environment or where you have individuals, um, you have no supervising um, governance structures. To your second uh, question, um, in our um, report, we are referring to issues like um, that a certain uh, tax planning activity has no economical background or no transactional connectivity. So it's, it is purely artificial. That could be a factor. And if something is part of a transaction and transactional nature, it will have a different um, relevance and perhaps also the appearance will be different. So we will handle or discuss this transactional driven structuring, yes, but we will not look at certain structures, specific structures, because we are not um, want to make uh, give examples of certain national or international tax uh, uh, structures, but we will look at the uh, economical substance of certain transactions. So that will be um, a part of the discussion, yes. Thank you, Jens. I'm not seeing any. Well, I, I am now. Hild, Hilda uh, Blom, you have the floor. Thank you very much, Kaylin, and good morning, good afternoon, good night uh, to everybody on the call. Um, thank you very much, uh, Jens, for your presentation and for the work that you and your working group have done until now. Um, and overall, uh, Accounts Europe is uh, supportive of uh, what you have uh, presented and, and brought forward. Um, so we are sure that, uh, or we assume that the uh, ISBA uh, board will approve uh, your project proposal later on this month. Um, just a few things. Um, you um, uh, will appreciate that uh, actually a lot of discussions have already happened in different uh, jurisdictions on this, including in the European Union. And uh, a lot has already been done in this area also by my organization, by Accounts Europe. And um, um, in, in order to, to, to help you to reflect on how you could bring this forward, um, we have found that uh, it's uh, not very straightforward to actually define uh, those concepts like uh, aggressive tax planning, tax avoidance, tax evasion. And um, you uh, propose potentially only as a working title to work with acceptable, uh, non-acceptable uh, tax planning. So um, how in Europe this has been taken forward is that uh, I think as Scalen said, um, there's not necessarily a definition, but there are factors or in Europe, we call them characteristics that are considered, for instance, as you said, is a transaction artificial or not? Is it exploiting loopholes or not? Is it uh, using mismatches in legislation? Is it using uh, mismatches in legislation between different countries? You know, to, to use those type of things to indicate something is acceptable or something is not acceptable. So. Uh, uh, I think I, I would like to make that comment in order for you to reflect if you want to define and you uh, see that that is difficult to do because those concepts mean very different things in uh, different jurisdictions and for different people. And, and so maybe it might be a help to work based on factors or characteristics. As an example, for instance, in your papers, um, you delink aggressive tax planning from tax avoidance, but in Europe and in the UK, that 
basically means the same, those two, those two uh, matters. Um, two final comments. Um, we very much support uh, indeed making the link with uh, other matters that have already been done. For instance, the OECD, this uh, a pillar two proposal for having a minimum effective tax potentially between 15 and 25% obviously will help such a project to, to actually move forward. Um, and uh, there was also the reference to the tax profession. And indeed, in certain jurisdictions, for instance, in France, you have to be a lawyer to provide tax advice. So it's not with the accountants. So it is important to not just look at uh, the profession of accountants and, and auditors or uh, uh, tax advisors uh, within our profession, but also see how actually outside uh, of our profession, uh, this can actually resonate uh, because um, we understand indeed in the legal profession, some of those matters are considered, but it would be good that what uh, you come up with is also considered there. For instance, in Europe, we're aware of the CFA tax advisors having uh, issued a paper not so long ago on uh, these matters, uh, but uh, hopefully, um, or maybe more needs uh, to be done. Uh, so hopefully these were uh, helpful comments for you and uh, happy to support the project um, and um, come back to you uh, when uh, you were working on it. Thank you very much. Galen, uh, you're on mute. All right, so... Uh, Jens, how would you like to do this going forward? Do you want to respond to uh, Hilda right now, or would you like to take a few more? I th think we can take a few more, and okay. I'm writing my comments down and we'll summarize okay. them. Okay, thank, thank you. you. So, Don, uh, I see you next. Uh, thank you, and uh, thank you very much for your presentation, Jens. Um, it certainly appears when uh, looking at the scope that this is going to be a very broad and far reaching project. So you have uh, a lot of work ahead of you. Um, the SMPAG continues to remain very concerned about the project, as uh, you'll likely remember from my March comments. Um, just a couple of uh, concerns that I wanted to drill down on. I, I'm concerned about how the provisions would interact with domestic anti-avoidance rules and whether or not when you come to the end of the project and you have your final proposal, if that will be able to be uh, adopted, particularly globally. And also uh, looking at it from the domestic side after it was adopted by PAO, whether or not the government would then start to take a more hostile approach against practitioners if uh, the changes were made because it would lead to them having uh, higher um, prospects about what really our role was uh, within the tax planning. Thanks. Thank you, Don. And uh, I see Paul Munter. Uh, Paul, are you on mute there, Paul? There you go. Um, do you hear me? Yes. Ah, thank you. Uh, similar comments to um, what were being made a second ago. I mean, I think that <clears throat> the challenge is going to be um, obviously getting the getting the words right and, and distinguishing between uh, accountants versus responsibility of, of auditors. I'll come back to auditors in just a second. Uh, but with, with, with accountants in business, I think one, trying to articulate the threshold is, is a challenging undertaking as to, you know, what is sufficiently uh, uh, appropriate tax planning strategy. I, I also think that motivation has to be a big part of the um, process and understanding, uh, to me, it's, it's one thing to have a situation where a company is contemplating a transaction and wants to engage in that transaction in as tax effective a manner as possible versus somebody coming up with a tax strategy and then bringing it to the company 
uh, to to put a structure in place that is uh, highly mo- highly tax motivated. So so the the motivation uh, behind the arrangement I think is a really important aspect of the analysis that that needs to be very carefully fleshed out. <clears throat> and then turning to the auditor side, uh, a really important aspect of this I think is that if tax planning is something that the auditor is doing, in effect, the tax planning is an advocacy role. And from an independence perspective, it is really difficult, if in fact not impossible, to put in safeguards sufficient to overcome an advocacy threat. So I think that's something that that IESBA will need to think through very carefully as it proceeds with this project. Thanks, Galen. Thank you, Paula. Why don't we pause here? Uh, Jens, did you want to yeah. maybe field these, and then we'll go forward? Thank you, Galen, and thank you to all of you for your very helpful comments. Hilde, yes. Um, um, I think um, what I wanted to say was not that IESPA will create appropriate division, definitions, but to have an emphasis on the diversity of terminology and to be careful to find a right approach. And in our um, uh, final report, we are tending uh, towards a factor or, or, or challenges or characteristics uh, approach. So there we are very close. And just uh, as a footnote, we, we have also uh, planned an outreach activity to CFE uh, only for timing reasons, we couldn't do it in the summer, but we will have it now in September. So we are aware of other professions or a wider professional approach uh, as the tax advisor organization in Europe has published a discussion paper. Um, so thank you for, for also this support. And Don, um, we, we are uh, uh, realizing your concerns and I think it's quite difficult to have this discussion before starting really with drafting, because as, as we are now in a more principle-based manner, I could only say there will be no dom- domestic uh, um, conflicts, because if there is a domestic anti-avoidance rule concept, they, this should be easily part of the global principle-based approach. But I can't prove it now because we don't know how exactly. We, but it's the intention of, and the proposal is not to find um, uh, um, um, a different approach, but somehow to, to, to give on a global level, and you can compare it perhaps uh, with a NOCLA project where the local jurisdiction is in the primary role but on a global level there is an overarching principle and something like this we have in mind so hopefully we 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 will achieve this but that is up to the task force to find a proper balanced language and to see this potential conflicts and the um, we we take your concerns um very seriously and paul um i think a factor uh, you mentioned, the motivation, is very important. And um, I, I, we have called it in our uh, paper, the context of a, of a certain tax planning activity is very important. And uh, as Galen mentioned earlier, it's a transaction, it's the motivation. Is it uh, coming from the blue? Is it in the context of an of a economical uh, 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 desire, which is uh, reasonable, etc. So I think that is that is uh, um, very very uh, important um, to to look at this subjective or contextual um, factor. The auditor side, in the uh, on the one side, is has been addressed now um, with uh, the non-assurance service project and with the requirement in six o four. Um, where um, any tax planning activities are seen as uh, as uh, uh, problematic, and um, uh, so 
but we will look at your point um, uh, you mentioned, and I fully agree that there is um, the advocacy threat, and we will probably see that whether this is adequately now addressed with the new NIS provisions, yes or no. Thank you. Thank you, thank you, Johnson. I see uh, Wei Meng. Wei, you may speak. Hello. Hello. Thanks, Gavin. Hello, everyone. Yes, we can hear uh, you. I appreciate. Okay, thank you. I appreciate the work has been done by the task force, and thanks a lot for the presentation by Yan. Uh, I'm pleased to see this hard project reach this stage. I would like to make two comments. First is similar to what Jens already comment. Uh, I think it's important to remind or to require the PAs to carefully analyze the business purpose of the transaction or the, or the tax planning strategy. Uh, the, that's the first comment. And second comment is the approach uh, elaborated in the pro project proposal or principles based framework noted in the presentation is clearly articulated. And in my view, it's a practical approach. Uh, I would like to see this approach as well carried out during the project. As a stakeholder in the last, I would like to ask to elaborate more about to develop suitable term terminology to support building of the framework, which is mentioned in paragraph 16 of the project proposal. That's all, thank you. Thank you, Wei. And uh, Heisen? Uh, thank you, Kaila. And uh, thank you, Jens, for a very good presentation and uh, for the work done on this uh, quite an important uh, project. Uh, on uh, uh, behalf of uh, EFAA, I have to say that uh, although we were uh, uh, at first with option C, we uh, agree with uh, option A, uh, what means the principle-based framework. And from that point of view, it would be very good because uh, this will help uh, uh, organizations and uh, the profession also to be well prepared in uh, dealing with this uh, very important issue that is related uh, directly with the public uh, uh, interest. Uh, I fully agree also with Hilde with regarding uh, the fact that uh, this uh, project has to uh, resonate also with other professions which uh, are involved uh, in uh, providing these uh, kind of services. And this will be very helpful if we consider the fact that, uh, as we heard, there is not a clear distinction between the uh, pies and non pies. Uh, 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 in serving uh, to the uh, tax. So we fully support uh, the, the project and uh, uh, we uh, do hope that uh, within this time there, is, there will be a lot of time for uh, well uh, prepared of the uh, professional bodies in order, professional organization, council organization to deal with this uh, important issue. Thank you. Thank you, Heisen. And I see Asha, you've uh... You've had your hand raised, but you're on mute right now. For the presentation, James, uh, your rationale behind the project proposal were clearly elaborated. And we, as an audit and accountants uh, regulator, we are fully supportive of your proposals. Uh, and also, uh, from a regulator's perspective, I would also like to agree to the recommendation of focusing on option A. Uh, purely because uh, you can... Asha, I'm having a hard time hearing you a little bit. Are you close enough to your microphone? Is it clear now? That's better. Thank you. Okay. And uh, just... Am I audible now? Much better. Okay. Okay. I just want to say, give a comment that we are fully supportive of these proposals. And uh, that, uh, and from a regulator's perspective, I also would like to agree on the recommendation of the working groups uh, focusing on option A, as we see that including in the code itself will increase the accountability and uh, and on the uh, the uh, transparency and uniformity across the profession. 
and uh, what i want to comment here is that uh, you know as uh, in the regulator's perspective we have come across many instances like this like where the professional accountants and the tax consultants appears to have misused the gray areas of the law like you have like it, uh, mentioned in the proposal particularly relating to uh, transfer pricing aspects like making use of tax holiday companies to shift the profits uh, and uh, sometimes even tax evading aspects like creating contracts for this purpose itself so on the other hand like uh, i think most jurisdictions tax laws are not simple so interpretations have to be used clearly for the company sometimes they use it for the company's benefit and uh, one more thing one more clarification i have is the extent of the topic like when you say tax planning and related service i was wondering whether advisory services like account relating to accounting issues particularly on uh, tax related deferred tax matters will also come uh, be covered under this project or does it cover under like advisory services and then under sure the uh, services project that's my comment for the moment thank you thank you asha i, I think that gives you uh, an opportunity to respond then yes yes uh, hi sir i don't i don't know if you had anything else or not uh, your hand is still raised yes thank oh. you um Thank you, Wei, and Heisen, and also Asha for your supportive comments to your specific question, Asha. Um, th this project is uh, for all activities of accountants related to tax, and the non-assurance service project just finalized in December last year is specially focused on the independence issue of the auditor perspective. So there may be some overlapping, and as I mentioned, we have some uh, a cross reference to 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 both topics, but the the scope of this project will be broad. So, tax planning and related services means all this type of tax services, and I put it now in a in a, in, in a, a simple language, which are a little bit uh, dodgy or grey or whatever you call it. Um, acceptable, well, non-acceptable, uh, aggressive, less aggressive. So all in this part will be, and we are not looking at specific taxes, whether it's corporate tax, inheritance taxes. Um, so we don't want to, uh, we have it in, in our back uh, mind to, to, to understand the situation and the factors, but we don't want to say in, in, in this jurisdiction or in this specific tax matter, this and that is right, but to have a framework to make first the professional accountant aware, for example, of a changed environment. And you mentioned this, Asher, that there is a development also over the last few years, what was acceptable at a certain time is nowadays seen as less acceptable. So this is also an issue which is very important um, for the perspective of the professional accountant to understand this changed environment and to make him aware of the risk um, in which he is then acting, giving um, um, advice or tax planning services, which are seen as problematic. But we will cover this. Uh, I see Conchita has raised her hand. Conchita, the floor is yours. You're on mute. Conchita? Yes. Uh, thank you. Um, yes. Uh, thank you. Um, the initiative is uh, endorsed from the financial executives organization. I would like to reiterate what I said last time. The matter on the particulars of uh... looks like we may have lost Conchita. I had a, a couple things that I thought I might uh, throw in here. Uh, yeah, it's back on, I think it was slide 11 and it had bodies that you were going to reach out to. I, I don't think that you can understate the, uh, the legal profession. 
particularly those that uh, work in the, the tax area, because you know uh, the the lawyers really are involved in many countries, including my own, in in this area, and I I think they could be particularly helpful. Those you know the uh, the various uh, attorney uh, associations and so forth. Then the other the other thing that I was wondering about, I'm having a little bit of a tough time with the linkage of ESG to your project, and I I think. I mean, I'm a big support of ESG. There's a lot of interest in it. Uh, we have an emerging issues uh, committee at the ESBA that is, is really focused on that and is going to be presenting to the board. I'm supportive of it, but I, I'm having a tough time linking what ESG really brings to the table specifically on this project. And there's a lot of references to it in the report, but I don't know that it's needed. And it, it seems to me that it murkies up the, 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 the water a little bit when you're talking about ESG and in tr trying to force something that I think a lot of people support, but no necessarily, is this the right place for it? Perhaps I can explain this point because it is, um, uh, on high agenda in certain jurisdictions but you see the GRI um, um, framework where there is a specific uh, standard on taxes and um, as now um, um, in Europe the discussion on um, um, sustainability reporting or ECG reporting uh, or corporate uh, sustainability reporting is ongoing there is um, 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 the probability that there will be standards on tax transparency and um, uh, proposed disclosures, uh, including tax strategies. And we have conversations with many global corporates which are including their tax strategies and their risk appetite for certain tax structures in their uh, sustainability reporting, ECG reporting. So that is a connectivity. So the professional accountant is confronted with, for example, tax strategies mentioned in their uh, reports, but perhaps these strategies are uh, not always, um, how to say, um, used in, in the company, or there is a perhaps an issue where the accountant is seeing they are publishing a certain strategy, but on the other hand, they are following certain uh, tax structures where is a mismatch. So I think the discussion of sustain sustainable taxation is also part of this project, not that also we want to develop any standard on any sustainability, transparency, et cetera issue, but the tax um, uh, risk assessment, our policies and procedures, I think are part of, of, of companies strategies and reporting, uh, uh, pu published reporting. And by that, the accountant is confronted with this item of ECG. I think this aspect we want to highlight. Thank you, Jens. I, I see a couple people have raised their hands again. Asha, you're, you're first up here. Or did you want to weigh in again, Asha? Sorry about that. I forgot to switch. Okay, I guess. I guess not then. Uh, uh, Hilda, you have your hand raised as well. Yes, thank you, Galen. I, I wanted to uh, really uh, support uh, what Jens just said and explained. Uh, I think it's not only in Europe, but definitely uh, taxation, taxation transparency, transparency on tax strategies uh, is definitely part of sustainability of a long term uh, view. Uh, a strategic view uh, that uh, is linked uh, with uh, the company. And uh, that's just part of it, um, where uh, we would have seen less of a link is actually uh, there is a linking with this 
uh, between this project and inducements. And okay, maybe some see the link here, we see this less. Uh, and it's partly also because we see this project as a positive project, whereas inducements are not necessarily seen that way. And so we, we weren't sure about that link, uh, but definitely we cl clearly see the link with ESG and especially the G uh, and tax transparency. So thank you for that. Thank you, Hilda. And I see, uh, Conchita, you're, you're back online. We lost you there for a moment. Did you have any, did, did you want to, to try again here. I'm not sure whether you have a connection that's working or not, though. I think Conchita might be off again. Oh, is she? OK. All right. Uh, Thank you. Helen. Oh, 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 just wait. Um, she's back. OK. Well, I... Conchita, perhaps if you want to. Um, yeah. Take your camera off. That that might uh, help a little bit. Um, uh, we, we might have missed most well, of that. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I I see. Uh, Doctor Tomadash Seth has his hand raised. Stavros, would you like to? Yes, thank you. I really appreciated very much the comments we have received. Uh, I just wanted to make two small points. First of all, because there was discussion about the auditor providing tax services, this project is not going to touch what we have done under uh, the NAS provisions, which have to do with independence in the case of providing NAS services to an audit client. Uh, this project is not destined at all, I think, to, to, to revise uh, NAS provisions. It has a different scope. I wanted to clarify that uh, so that there is no misconception. Uh, the second thing I would like to say is that um, uh, I personally, and I know most board members, this will probably be discussed very much also in our next meeting, uh, understand the difficulty that several of you, uh, Hilda mostly pointed out, namely that the meaning of acceptable and unacceptable fluctuates across jurisdictions. And we should be very careful in whatever we do uh, that we don't put professional accountants in the difficult position of um, trying to uh, derive an acceptable or an accept or a line between acceptable and unacceptable behavior that might be beyond the legal or uh, expectational arrangement in their own jurisdiction. And I'm sure, and I think he sends, uh, Jens said that, um, we are going to be very careful uh, in, in, in that respect. That's the difficulty of the project. If the definition were obvious, uh, the project would be indeed very easy. But I think, I think that uh, we have shown that we can tackle difficult subjects. That's all. Thank you all very much though, for your comments. Appreciate them. Thank you, Stavros. Uh, Jens, uh, I don't see any other hands raised. I don't know if she, Conchita, I don't see that she has come back yet. Um, would you like to make some yes. final comments here? A very brief remark only to, to Hilda's comment on inducements. I will try to, to explain why we are mentioning inducements. Is It is more uh, how inducements are approached in the code. So the technique and the, 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 the for example, inducements are on the first, it could be um, acceptable and unacceptable. <laughs> And if you're looking at the extant code, we have this differentiation. And that's why we're looking a little bit as a concept to the inducement. And that is what Paul mentioned. The environment and the intention is very important because that is one of the key different um, 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 factors which are also relevant in the inducement sectors. Only that's why we are looking technical at this part to, to understand and to, to have an example how to approach 
such an issue where it is not always crystal clear whether you are in the white or in the darker uh, uh, part um, of the discussion. So that's why we are referring in the paper to inducements only as explanation. And uh, finally, I'm very thankful for all your comments and for, for your concerns and support. And we will, as Stavros said, discuss this intensively in, uh, in our next board session. And the task force especially will then, if it will be um, um, agreed, um, um, discuss this very carefully. Thank you very much. Okay, then. Uh... Jeff, should we move forward uh, and start uh, the next session, or do we want think, to take think, a break I think now, Dr. 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 Chan, um, oh, I'll be able to observe this comment. I, I see that. Yes. Yes, please. So, uh, so hello, everyone. Uh, I'm so happy you know, to be involved in the, today's discussion of the CAG meeting as a PIOB observer today. So I do think that, that, that we are reaching a point, uh, you know, the, 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 the last point of the, the topic of tax planning. I just want to, you know, add some words as observer. So I generally, I was impressed by the in-depth discussions on the topic tax planning. With regard to the topic of the tax planning as my colleagues at the PIOB, express that at uh, similar occasions previously, I want to uh, reiterate that we are on the right track in terms of the importance and urgency of the issue. Specifically, the recommendations identified by the WG on tax planning are commendable. I observed that implications on the side of the social responsibility and the sustainability that the tax planning services raises being considered. That is what the PIO be concerned about most and welcome a lot. In terms of the consultation targets, it is noted in the slides that tax authorities are included through the OECD. Considering that tax planning services are closely related to the law structure in specific jurisdiction. So it might be meaningful that along with the next round of consultation, outreaching tax authorities in different jurisdictions might be, you know, uh, you know, welcome. The last point I would like to add is that other uh, ISBI projects have been considered to delineate a possible way forward, i.e. the approach adopted in inducements and the possible actions that PA should need to take. These projects could be a good starting point for tax planning project. However, it is encouraged for IPSBA to debate about whether they set ethical expectations at the right level. For instance, inducements established ethical requirements in the area that may have a more limited or private impact, while tax planning has broader implications affecting large economies and the society at large. Hence, the ethical expectations and the requirements should set a high bar. So thank you, that's just what I want to comment. Thank you so much. Uh, thank you, Dr. Chen. Uh, did, Stavros, did, did you have anything else? Your hand is still raised. No, you're good, okay. Uh, we'll bring this, uh, Jeff, then were we gonna take our break or start the next session here? Uh, yes, we're gonna take. We can take a fifteen-minute uh, break, uh, so that'll take us to um, nine thirty-five Eastern time in the U.S. Okay, thank you. Thank you.
Jeff, I'm seeing everybody's smiling faces popping back up on my screen. So it, I think our our break is just about to an end. Uh, yes, and um, Ron has just joined us as well. Okay, good. All right, well, our, uh, everyone's back now. Uh, we're going to move into the, the second agenda item on uh, technology. Uh, we're going to have two presenters on this. Uh, Brian Friedrich is the working group uh, presenter and, and chairman. And uh, Rich Hushkin is uh, the, the task force uh, chairman. And maybe I just throw out there, I'll, if you can indulge me for a second, what's the difference between a working group and a task force? A task force, if I'm in incorrect, is uh, where there's an actual project to revise the code, whereas a working group is preliminary to that. In this case, uh, they are working on research and uh, and uh, uh, not non authoritative uh, uh, materials. So we're going to start with uh, with with uh, with Rit with Rit not Rich with Brian, and uh, Brian, the floor is yours for your presentation. Great, thanks very much, Galen, and good day, everyone. All right, so Rich and I are uh, pleased to be with you today to uh, provide an update on the activities of both the working group and the task force over the past couple of quarters. And I'll thank Cam uh, Leung in advance, our very capable staff support, uh, who's also advancing our slides today. And on that note, uh, next slide, please. Great. So for today's agenda, I'll be starting out with the uh, technology working group update. Uh, I'll hit some of the highlights, but note also that you've received uh, agenda item C1 that summarizes all of our activities uh, since we spoke last. Uh, after my update, I'll pass over to Rich, who's chairing the task force, as Galen mentioned, uh, who's, who's then going to run through the anticipated uh, proposed changes to the code, get your views and reactions on those task force proposals that they hope uh, to have approved at the December IESBA meeting, and then expect to expose in early 2022. Uh, i also call your attention there to agenda item C3, uh, which gives a markup of the task force's proposed changes uh, from the extant code. And it's customary, of course, at the end, we'll do a, a report back on our previous discussion that was held with you in March. And then next slide, please. Okay, so this slide uh, just provides essentially uh, what uh, Galen was just mentioning it's an illustrative reminder about what our uh, collective work is, how it's being structured uh, by these two different uh, but still overlapping work streams. Uh, so the working group is continuing our research and fact finding and then also developing non-authoritative guidance and educational materials that we're doing either alone or in collaboration with other groups. Uh, we continue to hear requests from uh, stakeholders to provide materials on the intersection between ethics and technology uh, as emerging technologies become ever more prevalent in our organizations around the world. And then, of course, we have the task force working on developing principles-based revisions to the code that are based on recommendations that flowed out of the technology working group phase one final report. Uh, and as I mentioned on the last slide, their exposure is targeted for board approval by the end of this year. In the next slide. Okay, so we're going to start with the working group activities. And next slide. Okay, getting going with the fact-finding activities that our team is conducting. Um, as you'll recall, the original uh, working group first concentrated on AI and, and the big data space. And although we continue to monitor developments in those areas, we spent the last six months looking more closely at blockchain, cybersecurity, uh, and some data governance issues. Of course, these technologies and issues tend to be interrelated, so we're gathering information on all of them simultaneously, but our discussions have been emphasizing uh, blockchain and cyber, always with the focus, of course, on the ethical implications for PAs, um, whether that's uh, with respect to potential topics for non-authoritative materials or where we see implications for uh, further revisions to the code that should be considered. Our fact-finding work includes a fair amount of desk research, 
so reading articles, participating in, in webinars and so on. But a lot of it is also achieved through outreach meetings with stakeholders. And I'll run through our uh, meetings on the next slide to give you a sense of the, the breadth of perspectives uh, that we're receiving. But I also want to point out the link on this slide that you can use to get our briefing paper uh, that was developed. Uh, other than giving you a, a more detailed background about the project, uh, this document also provides a fairly robust list of key questions that we're interested in from different stakeholders when we undertake our outreach discussions. And it's really what we send along to stakeholders as, as prep material, if you will, uh, for our meeting and then get them thinking about the questions that we're looking to discuss. And then on the next slide. Okay, so then with respect to recent out meetings, uh, outreach meetings, it's been uh, a fairly busy few months. Uh, for our group since we officially formed and launched in March of this year. Uh, we've held numerous meetings with a, a broad range of diverse stakeholders, both geographically and by function. Uh, so including on the firm side, KPMG, whom we met with twice actually, both with the global IT attest lead to really talk more about some of the consulting sorts of functions, and then also with their uh, global independence group lead. Um, PwC and their chief digital officer uh, team from Hong Kong and China, uh, from PAFA, and, uh, and, and for PAFA we'll be uh, drafting some brief articles on technology and ethics to be included in their monthly newsletter over the next several months as we raise awareness around some of the key issues that we're seeing flow out of the working group, uh, and then also helping to lay the groundwork for a planned event in the region uh, likely and, and, and hopefully in uh, Q2 of next year. Uh, the first newsletter submission is the middle of this month, so you'll be able to see that on their site. Uh, MindBridge, uh, whom some of you will recognize, uh, build an AI risk uh, discovery platform for uh, both firms and for corporate entities. Then the Institute of Management Accountants to discuss some of the issues that are of particular interest to PAIBs. Uh, the U.S. Office of the Controller of the Currency, who obviously uh, charter, regulate, and supervise uh, all of the U.S. national banks. And on that note, I'd specifically like to thank uh, Rob DiTullio in, in CAG and his colleague uh, Mary Catherine Kearney uh, for that outreach discussion from, from more of a public sector perspective. That was very helpful. Uh, also, Accountancy Europe and, and their TechNet, uh, we've chatted with them uh, and, and Accounts of Europe actually for a couple of times. Uh, ACCA to talk about potential collaboration on developing NAM and also to receive thoughts on AI and its tie to ESG. Uh, CPA Canada and their Independent Standing Committee, uh, which involved an overview of both the TWG work as well as the, the task force's work and, and giving a preview of those potential uh, code revisions, obviously in particular around independence. Uh, and then separately, two of us were also interviewed recently for a CPA Canada podcast that's going to air later this month on the future of the profession with specific reference to the ethics implications of uh, technology and change, in which we obviously drew back to uh, other IESBA work in, in different projects. And then finally on the slide, we've got uh, the University of Akron, where we met with uh, Professor Calderon who provided valuable research summaries uh, to our working group on blockchain and cybersecurity. So there's a, a lot going on in the background here uh, at this point, but I really again want to emphasize that we're always keen to have discussions with interested individuals or groups on any issues relevant to ethics and technology. And if any of you would like to, to contribute information uh, to our gathering efforts on some of the topics and, and questions that you see in the briefing paper, for example, or, or what you really think is important and, and that we should be looking at from that ethics perspective, um, please reach out to either Cam or myself because, you know, obviously in a CAG meeting we can only do so much in terms of getting into uh, any sort of in-depth discussion. Okay, and then the next slide, please. And then I wanted to spend a couple of minutes here on, on two recent activities that we were involved in. Uh, Cam and I participated on an American Accounting Association panel that was related to the ethics of blockchain, smart contracts, and related tech. Um, other speakers covered the sort of the technical side of how these technologies are being used in business 
but from the working group perspective, we focused on how blockchain and its applications are impacting compliance with the fundamental principles. So, for example, the, the linkage to professional competence and due care is probably pretty obvious. The technology is relatively complicated, and more importantly, probably it's not in the core competence of most professional accountants yet. Um, when I think about the uh, the polls that we have of professional accountants uh, through professional development courses as to whether they're confident uh, that they can have a meaningful discussion about blockchain and uh, with their clients or their employers, we consistently see only about 5 to 10% of PAs self-selecting that they could do that. And so we need to build competence in that technical area within the profession. Uh, and in the meantime, we need to recognize the importance of consulting with experts. Uh, there's also implications uh, for other principles. So, for example, in the context of integrity, using blockchain can help enhance our ability to demonstrate integrity by supporting the authenticity of transactions, which enhances trust. But it might be challenged, on the other hand, in situations where we have concerns that the blockchain is being used for nefarious purposes or to obfuscate the source of funds or what have you uh, through uh, relative an anonymity. And so a PA would be expected to take action in the face of those kinds of concerns. On objectivity, we have to be aware of the potential for over-reliance on the blockchain. Uh, of course, the immutable nature is one of the key benefits, but it's not infallible either. It can be targeted by bad actors. We still need to be concerned about the first mile problem as well uh, to ensure only accurate information is what's getting into the blockchain in the first place. And in the next confidentiality, we have to think about who has access to private keys, um, which also raises potential independence questions. So you know, a client would, would never pass over all the keys to uh, buildings and the safe to the auditor. So what are the implications of doing that with a more digital equivalent? And of course, there can be challenges uh, if others on the chain wish to remain anonymous. And uh, does, does that impact uh, confidentiality for that information, but we also have to know who we're dealing with in order to properly apply a professional skepticism, evaluate relationships for potential independence issues or other conflicts of interest. And then finally, on professional behavior, we have to frame all of these sorts of questions in the context of ensuring compliance with the evolving laws and regulations in this space and protecting the reputation of the profession while meeting our broader public interest responsibilities. So those are just some of the, uh, the discussions that came out of that event. And the other event that's uh, noted here uh, was only last week, and uh, that was a, a roundtable event that was held virtually in the uh, Middle East North Africa region, hosted by SOCPA, the uh, Saudi Organization of CPAs, and it was kicked off by their CEO, uh, Dr. Al Mugamis. A huge thanks again to CAM for also working on the logistics with SOCPA staff to arrange an event of this size. Uh, myself and another uh, working group member who also works in the region keynoted with presentations on the IESBA's recent work in tech and some of our other key projects. Uh, following the, the sort of initial presentations, then uh, I served as a panelist together with uh, it, it, former chief audit executive at Saudi Aramco, who's now on uh, several large boards. Uh, the firms were represented by a, a head of audit for KPMG in the region, and then also from the academic community, uh, the deputy dean of business at uh, Taiba University, uh, who also researches, uh, researches AI ethics and business was uh, presenting. So in total, we had over 400 delegates from around that region uh, for the, the keynote and the panel segments that uh, certainly represented a broad range of stakeholders from PAIBs to practitioners and then including also regulators, other academics, IT professionals, lawyers, uh, and so on. Uh, we also had three breakout sessions that were by invitation only. It was for about another 90 minutes where we had uh, approximately 40 delegates grouped by uh, regulators and then there's a small group of uh, accountants and auditors and then finally those charged with governance and IT professionals were together. Uh, we've got a, a copious amount of notes that we're, uh, we're now working through to leverage both as input for our fact-finding mission and, and also the development of, of other non-authoritative materials. And we certainly look forward to a future collaboration with SOCPA and other bodies in the region. 
Uh, that was extremely useful what came out of that and getting some different perspectives. Uh, just for flavor, uh, delegates really emphasized the, the potential opportunities of incorporating technology, provided a lot of examples of how that's being used in different organizations. Uh, many had also witnessed, however, firsthand the dangers of insufficient collaboration between those who understand the technology and those who understand the objectives, the risks and the outputs of using some of these technologies. There's also emphasis on the need for upskilling of PAs and for more active ongoing collaboration between uh, tech developers and ensuring that the right tool is being used in the right way. And then cybersecurity was another thing that was uh, highlighted as being a significant concern, again, uh, with expectations around additional skill for PAs and also uh, abilities to work with experts to meet the obligations of the profession for confidentiality, uh, data governance, and data stewardship, uh, protecting the public, of course, and from a sort of more task perspective, providing accurate and reliable information. So these events were really productive for us. We're working uh, towards similar events like this, as I mentioned, with, uh, with Africa and also with South America in the future. Okay, next slide, please. Okay, and then uh, quick comments here on non-authoritative guidance and the educational materials that are either in the works or that are on the horizon. Uh, as I'd mentioned during the March CAG meeting, the, uh, the working group was involved with the Global Roundtable event back in February that was hosted by uh, CPA Canada, ICAS, and IFAC. Uh, the theme was ethical leadership in an era of complexity and digital change. Uh, we issued an exploratory paper prepared at that time and as follow-on outputs, four papers are being developed to more closely explore some of the key themes that arose during that session uh, with topics that are obviously on the slide here. Uh, on complexity, that paper was released in early August and it's available on our focus page. The second that deals with technology as a double-edged sword, that's just entering the uh, production process right now. Uh, the third on mis- and disinformation is at first draft stage. It's ready to begin its review. And then the final paper in the series on professional competence has been uh, outlined. So we're also excited to be working with, uh, at the moment, a couple of other groups on developing materials. And notably, uh, again, a couple of them on the slide here with the Australian uh, Accounting Professional Ethics and Standards Board on Auditor Independence with some scenarios that will walk through potential issues that auditors or firms might face and where in the code to look when addressing these and similar sorts of issues. Uh, that paper has been drafted and it's now in the review stage. And then we're collaborating with the Japanese Institute of CPAs on a, a further ethical leadership piece where the JICPA is looking to extend that joint IFAC, CPA Canada, ICAS, uh, NAM work by uh, again, drafting a, a selection of sample scenarios where PAs face ethics issues that are related to technology development, implementation, or use, uh, both in PAIB and PAPP context. And here we're in the outline and initial drafting stage of that work. Uh, again, all of these uh, resources are, are either going to be or are already available on the tech focus page with uh, the link that's at the bottom of this slide here. And once more, with my marketing hat on, uh, collaboration and guidance on educational materials or presentations and so on is always welcome. So if you've got ideas, uh, please get in touch with us. And then next slide. And then to close out uh, my part of the, the presentation, just a few comments about the TWG's uh, proposed way forward. Again, this was in the agenda uh, document. Uh, we're proposing to continue our fact-finding and uh, non-authoritative material work beyond year-end, which is going to allow for completing a full year's work as well as providing some additional time to synthesize, analyze, and report on the insights that we've gained. Uh, we're looking to issue our report in September of 2022, uh, summarizing our findings uh, to that point from all activities and obviously providing some updates in between time but before then. Uh, that timeline is going to help us, though, incorporate uh, relevant information that's related to the IESBA decisions regarding the tech exposure draft and some of the key messages within the exploratory memorandum. Um, 
to facilitate the board's work on the sort of the right hand side there. We're also looking to establish an external advisory committee in coordination with the IAASB and IFACS technology advisory groups. Uh, this idea originated out of a discussion with our National Standard Center liaison group where some members expressed interest in either uh, forming or being involved with an advisory group of this sort. Uh, and I note that the uh, IESBA also expressed broad support for that idea in June. So we expect that this standing advisory committee uh, will be the source of information for our tech initiative and for IESBA more generally and also provide resources for review, uh, development, and awareness raising of future NAM. And to get the right diversity of perspectives, we're, we're going to look at including not only uh, NSS members, but also other stakeholders, uh, including technology developers, where, where we think that's very important to, to sort of help polish our crystal ball about what might be coming on the tech side. Okay, next slide. Okay, so I will pause here if there's any uh, questions, comments, or feedback at this point, and then uh, Rich will be on next. Hey, thank you uh, very much for that, Brian. Uh, and uh, it's an opportunity for representatives to, to comment on what they heard. Um, I guess, you know, uh, Brian, are, is there any any particular areas that you're interested in in some feedback? I I heard the thing about the uh, the external advisory uh, committee and its linkage with the board. Is would there be any any questions there as to what what you what 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 the reaction might be? I don't see any raised hands. That would that would absolutely be it, though, uh, Galen. It's sort of the the direction that we're going, the issues that we're looking at, folks that we're speaking with, and and yes, the, yeah. the sort of future of uh, continuing this process beyond the end of the year and and forming some kind of an advisory group in this area. Well, there there certainly is overlap, uh, I guess, with as you pointed out earlier. Uh, what about the the working group? I keep hearing questions about hosting and confidentiality. I didn't see that with any of the publications that you're currently working on with NAM. Is it, are they, are, are they in the other, just in the, the, the task forces remit or are you thinking about some, some uh, activity there? Yeah, so with respect to, to confidentiality, that's certainly included in several of our papers. So uh, the the one that's entering production now, the, the technology is a double-edged sword. So confidentiality forms a part of that because it's, it is one of the risks of implementing some of these technologies. Um, I also think about the COVID-19 paper that, uh, that came out that addressed some of those issues around remote work uh, and things of that sort. And, and so that's a more, I, I would say, popular topic that finds its way in. Uh, we do have to be careful, of course, as a working group, not to kind of preempt. We can lay the groundwork, we can socialize, raise awareness, and so on of some of these issues, but we can't really preempt what the uh, what the task force is doing. So it is a balance in that way. Um, it, it, so that's that's confidentiality on the hosting side. That that's probably even more. Uh, we have to be even more careful in that area. Uh, it gets some mention again in the in the tech as a double-edged sword in, in that sort of idea. Uh, just again to raise awareness of thinking about some of the risks of providing these different services, and uh, and, and it might be good feedback just in terms of the the auditor independence piece that we're working on with uh, the Australian APESB. Well, I don't see any raised hands. Uh, I'll, I'll vote for the uh, advisory committee and and throw my support behind it. I think uh, this is a broad enough area. And, you know, so many practitioners don't necessarily have deep technology backgrounds in it. I think the point that you're raising is we need to, to reach out and pull somebody, some of those folks into the, uh, you know, the uh, uh, area that we're working in here. So I'll, uh, I'll leave it at that, Brian. Did you have any final thoughts? Or do we need to turn it over now to Rich? 
we'll head into uh, Rich's discussion there on the proposed changes. But thanks very much. And by all means, get in touch uh, if you do have feedback comes to mind later. Thanks, Galen. Okay. Rich, the floor is yours. Thank you, Galen, and, and uh, hello to everybody. Um, why don't we move to the next slide? I wanted to start with a little bit of a of a, just a recap from prior sessions, and that obviously the, there are proposed revisions to the code that we're going to go through today, as you saw in the materials. Um, um, those are informed by really many a number of years of work by the technology working group that culminated in phase one project. Um, I do remind the CAG that uh, the, the recommendations, the project plan was approved before uh, the board completed role and mindset in NAS. And so some of the matters in the recommendations of uh, the issues paper were in fact uh, addressed by role and mindset in NAS. We'll spend a minute on that. Um, we talked a lot at the last meeting about the two surveys on complexity and auditor independence. Those obviously influenced this. And then there's been a lot of stakeholder outreach. Actually, we went back and added it up. And before the project plan was submitted, there were 21 sessions of outreach. And since the project plan was submitted, there's been 26. And we'll talk about some important ones that we have planned uh, still to go. Uh, as we go through this, but let me start with role and mindset because it, it made some very important, uh, uh, included some very important additions to the code. Um, it placed this renewed emphasis on the responsibility to act in the public interest. It enhanced the fundamental principles, including, you know, including the reference to consideration of technology. It introduced uh, the requirement to have a court inquiring mind. And it introduced organizational cultural roots and ethics. And as we go a little further, we'll talk a little bit about how those and, the, and other things, we can go to the next slide, were picked up on. on in particular, um, uh, there was reference in role and mindset about the importance of considering whether you had undue influence or undue reliance uh, on technology, uh, as well as uh, some, some considerations around automation bias. In terms of NAS, as we move to the next slide, um, we, we uh, obviously NAS took pains to point out that uh, um, there are many things changing uh, in terms of the uh, uh, marketplace and technology. And as a result, you need to continue to remember the principles being applied by NAS because it's not possible to uh, necessarily articulate every possible scenario in in a doc in something like the code, uh, and so there are important reiterations there. But also, um, it prompts uh, NAS prompts the uh, professional accountant to consider in which the manner in which the NAS is provided. Uh, if we move to the next slide, please. Um, and that uh, in identifying and evaluating the threats. Uh, it provided some additional guidance on accounting and bookkeeping for routine and mechanical. And as you'll see in a moment, we are expanding on that. Uh, and it focused on, from a technology or IT systems perspective, the prohibitions on things that form part of the internal control over financial reporting or the financial accounting records, financial statements or systems. So let's look at uh, start with parts one, two, and three of the code. There are some important uh, revisions being proposed to that. Uh, this is a summary. We're going to spend a minute in a bit more detail on individual items, as you, you may have picked up on from the review of the materials. But we do focus on highlighting certain professional skills uh, needed. Um, we do address the confidentiality and the importance of maintaining confidentiality throughout the data governance cycle. And uh, we, we provide some principle, some, some uh, information on that. And we have provided a definition on confidential information, which I will go over in a moment. Uh, we you will see we have added a discussion on complexity to section 120 uh, and how complexity impacts the conceptual framework. We did that with technology in mind, but you will note, I hope, when you get to that, that it is written in a way that applies broadly across any 
complex circumstances that a professional accountant might incorporate. Uh, and that was felt to be consistent or encounter. And that was felt to be consistent with the principles based approach in the code. Um, and then there are some factors that PA should consider with dealing with technology. And I think a couple of the things that, that uh, Brian mentioned in his discussions and, and um, the importance of continuing to recognize, Gail, and to your point, uh, then all, not all PAs have the same level of skills. And that's something that's pointed out, you know, we point out in some of the factors uh, and the importance to get that help. Uh, so first of all, uh, if we could move, let's look at a couple of the particular things in, important here. Um, there is a uh, in span uh, section, expand, excuse me, uh, in 113.1a1, uh, building on the role and mindset to emphasize some specific skills, again, that are increasingly important. You can see those proposals in, in, the, uh, in uh, the change to addition of uh, subparagraph B there. Um, these are based on information that was included in materials from the IES, the International Education Standards, um, in the digital age. Uh, then we, uh, we get very focused on an issue uh, about transparency. Uh, and it really relates to the sufficiency of the information provided. As you know, R113.3 addresses that as a requirement, but uh, We've, we've added A1 to introduce the concept of the use of the reasonable and informed third party test in assessing whether the information that's being provided uh, is sufficient to enable the information, the, the recipient to understand uh, not just the nature of the services or activities, but also what are the inherent limitations therein. Uh, and that we and and it emphasizes you know we use this approach somewhat similar to no car uh, by taking the reasonable and third informed third party test, uh, but also build building off that test as it is exists throughout the code. Uh, and then on confidentiality, we you may recall in the prior straw man, um, there were two options presented. Uh, and there was much stronger support for option A, which largely let the, left the in extent or extant code intact, um, but suggested from the board's perspective, some enhancement over, over the, uh, what is uh, the need to protect data. And so there is this introduction of 114.1A2. Um, it builds off the need to maintain confidentiality that exists in the code. Um, but it emphasizes that the accountants should take, you know, take appropriate action to secure such information. And then you can see the data governance cycle outlined in the course of its collection, use, dissemination, and lawful destruction. Uh, and, that, and that was viewed as it's, it's not just at the time you're working on it, but you need to think about how you secure this throughout the, 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 the cycle in which you have that information. Um, and then, as I mentioned, if we could go to the next slide, this is the definition that has been proposed for confidential information. You'll note that it, it uh, addresses not only whatever form or medium that it is, including written or visual or oral or electronic. Those are all uh, um, covered and naturally the, the information is not in the public domain. Um, and it's designed to recognize that we increasingly have information that is confidential, that is uh, electronic um, in nature, and the importance of, uh, as I said on the prior slide, the importance of securing that throughout the data governance life cycle. The next item I mentioned just uh, quickly is um, the complexity, and we have added uh, material, application material to section 120 that addresses complex circumstances. Uh, you may recall that this was a matter that got some attention in the survey with a, a large support for, um, for addressing complexity, but not support uh, largely in the survey or frankly in any of the other um, 
outreach, there was not a lot of support for adding an additional additional threats in the code and that. So, and part of the consideration as we look at, uh, or as we think about the complexity um, is that um, technology unequivocally is uh, a source of considerable complexity and can be a source of um, complex circumstances, but that's not the only complexity or complex circumstances that professional accountants encounter. And so um, the materials uh, that have been developed are focused on the recognize that you can encounter complex circumstances. They increase the challenge to identifying, evaluating, and addressing the threats to the fundamental principles under the conceptual framework. Um, those, exa those examples of those challenges include um, where the facts and circumstances are heavily interconnected or interdependent elements that are in uncertain or unpredictable, uh, multiple variables and assumptions are examples of challenges that you can come up with, and we put some of that into the, the materials. And then providing some actions that might assist the professional. Uh, drawing on the role and mindset, we reiterate the importance of use of an acquiring mind uh, to, uh, to those aspects that make the circumstances complex. The importance of consultation with others, including experts, uh, to ensure that the appropriate challenge and additional input is obtained as part of the process. Uh, again, this runs to this fact that the professional accountant may not have uh, all of the if, uh, knowledge necessary needs to needs to proactively go obtain that. Um, make sure that there is discussion of the inherent uncertainties and difficulties arising from those facts and circumstances, uh, or the technology involved. Um, and then um, the need to monitor the complex circumstances to assess whether any developments or changes in those circumstances might impact any judgments that have been made or may be made. Uh, so that is, that is uh, the focus of what, um, of uh, the complexity uh, initiatives. And we, we included that in the appendix for your reading. They're, they're quite, it's, it's a, one of the longer sections. So we didn't put them in the main slides here. If we can then move to um, the uh, next slide, thank you. Um, also, it was important to, as I mentioned a few moments ago when we were covering the overall, what are the factors that need to be thought about when identifying threats to compliance with the fundamental principles and the conceptual framework? And those factors are being added in 126A5. Um, you know, they are as simple as the functioning of the technology, but the, requires you to think about whether the technology is appropriate for the use is going to be put to. Do, again, do you have as the professional accountant the relevant expertise uh, to use and importantly explain the output from the technology? And certainly whether the uh, um, technology uh, uses expertise or judgment uh, attributable to either the professional accountant in practices firm or the professional accountants in business employing organization and does that create uh, self-review or self-interest threats? And then finally, uh, we've added a, a, a section. Uh, this is the material from section 220, but there is comparable material in section 320 and part three of uh, factors to consider when relying on technology. Um, and Again, the I, I'm not gonna cover all these, but the nature of the activity to be performed by the technology is important. Uh, how is it expected that the technology output will be used and what extent of reliance is gonna be placed on that output? Uh, whether that technology has been successfully used in similar circumstances previously um, and if not, the outcome of any testing or evaluation of the effectiveness of the technology. Um, finally, 
the professional accountants, again, this is maybe the third time I've referenced this importance of the professional accountants ability to understand the output from the technology and in the context of which it's gonna be used. Uh, reiterating the point that if you don't have the expertise, um, as we mentioned a few slides ago, you need to go get that expertise. Uh, and so those are, um, those are the, the principal changes to parts one, two, and three of the code. I think I would summarize them to say that they are, uh, while heavily technology focused, they are the attempt uh, working with uh, the task force and with the staff. And we had the benefit of both uh, Diane Jules and Cam. Also, we had uh, Richard Fleck uh, assisting us with this. We've attempted to keep those in a, in a, in a much more principles-based approach. And in several cases that are applicable beyond just the uh, use of technology. Uh, such as the complexity area. So with that, I'm going to maybe pause here and seek uh, feedback, input, and uh, any questions. Yeah. Um, th thank you, Rich, for that uh, excellent uh, surmise of, of what you all have been, uh, where, where you've been going. I'm good. Before I take the, call, the, uh, the uh, hand from uh, uh, Jim Dalkin, I'm going to pause for a second because a couple of times you brought up uh, references to the survey and in preparing for the CAG, uh, one of the things that uh, was, was mentioned was, was feedback. And uh, a lot of the feedback, as I understand it, Rich, uh, has been from the profession, from regulators, and unfortunately not outside of that group and you would hope that it would be a little bit more broad than that. So I, I thought maybe I would ask you to perhaps speak to that, it, really taking into account that, you know, the, the representation of CAG is, is very broad and there's a lot of uh, organizations represented on the CAG that uh, are not directly considered part of, of, of the profession. And it would be good to hear from them, even, even if it's not in a comment letter response. So Rich, maybe you could, you could speak to that or maybe yeah. emphasize that. Yeah, I think that is important. I, I, I maybe went too fast through that when I talked about historical stakeholder, because um, the working group was gathering a lot of input and feedback um, throughout its efforts before it put the project proposal together. And, and yeah, there's no question um, the surveys were only one element of that. They were, um, and actually they were after the project plan was approved. Um, although there was, as we talked about in those surveys, um, there was much broader response than I think we we may have, uh, you, it, it always sticks out that the profession accountants in practice have their, their comments, but there was feedback from others, but we also have seen uh, some reluctance. Um, and maybe it's not just reluctance, maybe just not uh, taking the time to focus on written comments. But if you go back and look at, we had in our, in the issues paper, there was, as I said, 21 sets of interactions uh, before the issues paper came to the table. Um, they included um, Accountancy Europe was one, but the European Commission was one. The OECD had some input. Um, I'm only picking on a few here, some academic organizations. Um, there was a fair amount of regulatory, I would admit, input in, in that process um, as we went through it. And then subsequent to that, as Brian has been trying to take, every time there's one of these sessions, we're, we're looking for an understanding, um, uh, trying to understand if we are hearing something different, something uh, additive, something that could be helpful. I would say that, that we, ha um, the, the one group we're trying to get a little more understanding from is those charged with governance. Um, that seems to be the one place uh, that we have not uh, gotten as much input historically on some of these projects. Um, there may be reasons for that. Um, but I do think if you look at, you know, the, 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 the things that went on before the issues paper and then everything that's, you know, the 20 plus 26 or so events that have happened afterwards, um, those are all taken in some form of feedback. 
Um, we have, we did, we did talk, um, uh, uh, we, we spent some time with national standard setters and the COB, and then there's a slide coming up where I'll show you what some additional planned, at least the ones that are scheduled, additional uh, input as we have a more uh, finalized document. And certainly um, the, the input that this group gave us at the last session was uh, very helpful. Uh, again, reflecting some broader base. So I, I've, um, you know, we have talked about this at the, at the, at the task force. We've talked about this with the planning committee. Um, I think, I think there is probably a lot of input that has been received that doesn't necessarily get reflected in say, you know, head counts on surveys and things like that. But there's been a lot of activity over the, I'll say the last three years. Well, that thanks. helps a little bit with some color. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Thanks, thanks, Rich. I, I think it would be fair to say that if uh, if if you'd agree with it, uh, if it, any of the the folks on on this uh, pre, you know, uh, in the CAG uh, have any ideas of of how we might reach to those charged with governments, that you would appreciate that sort of feedback. Is uh, I think that. Uh, but but I see Jim has raised his hand, and then we have a few others. So I'll I'll uh, give the floor to Jim Dalkin. Thanks, Galen. I, I guess I and maybe it's the context in which relying on technology uh, plays out in in some work. So so I guess my question is uh, in two twenty to go down one two three four five 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 or so bullets, whether the technology was successfully used in similar circumstances. I, as a practical matter, let's say you're, you're testing under 540 uh, on the audit side and you're looking at a, a, you know, kind of a technology that looks at bond models or modeling of bonds or something like that. Is this to say that um, you would then have to, to go out and determine if that bond modeling technology is, is effective or, and correct? And if so, is that a documentation requirement? How does that interrelate to the audit requirements? Um, I, I'm, or am I just a little bit off on, on relying on the technology in that example? Well, um... Jim, maybe maybe I can build on your example, and maybe that would help because I do I do think you you raise, you ask a different, relatively interesting question in terms of the auditor side. The two twenty, as I mentioned, there, there are similar guidance in three twenty, but it's not exactly the same because three twenty is already more expansive with some requirements that are in there. But I would say, in your example, if that bond modeling example, let's say, is that if you're saying that's for valuation purposes, right? the expectation would be you need to understand what the technology does. You need to um, uh, provide appropriate testing of that. And in general, if you look at the auditing standards that go along with the independent standards, you know, that isn't just a matter of testing the technology model, but that often involves looking to other sources to validate that model and not just the model but the assumptions that go into it etc so i do i do think in you know that example if you're if the client in the professional accountant practice has a client that's using a bond model um, um, some kind of technology that's modeling bonds and it's relevant to the audit the auditor is expected to uh establish the um uh, appropriateness of the client's use of that model in terms of the input on the financials, but it may often, it may be that it's done in more than one way. I don't know if that, that's a pretty specific example, but I think the point would be in a higher level um, um, that the professional accountants in business need to understand whether the model has been successfully used um, and if not, what testing or other evaluation uh, has been done of the effectiveness? I think the auditor always has had and continues to have the obligation to determine 
the uh, functioning of the right technology as it relates to uh, its application, the impact on internal controls and on the financial statements. Maybe the, the corollary would be, is there a, like a documentation requirement? How would someone know if, if that person did make that assessment or evaluation? Yeah, I think, I think, I think uh, that's not really in the ethics and independence standards, but I believe, um, and we may want to have somebody speak up from the IAASB, but I believe there is clear documentation standards for the professional accountants in practice to document what they've done to establish the uh, functioning and effectiveness of controls and, and systems. Yeah, I, I, I think I, I kind of believe that, that what, what you're talking about there in a way, Jim, is it should be in the auditing standards. And in particular, some things that I've run across is, is when the technology is confidential. And that, that's sort of a, I, I think that's in the audit area, if I'm not mistaken, Rich. Yeah, yes, it uh, is. But uh, way you have your hand raised. Oh, thanks, Galen. Thanks for the uh, for Rich's presentation. Uh, I have I have I think uh, the task force has done a lot drafting work to the revisions of the code. My com comment comment will be about one hundred thirteen point one a one and also uh, one hundred. Oh, sorry, uh, about this this. Uh, I think what is added into the scale set looks uh, has little relationship with digital age from appearance. So my suggestion is that if we want to introduce into the application material, uh, we may introduce more, uh, we may elaborate more why we introduce that on the background of digital age. That's my suggestion, and also for the for the uh, the free, uh, how to say the drafting work of of the one hundred fourteen point one a two. This one I also similarly seems uh, not very directly linked to technology. So uh, my suggestion is to put more, put more uh, explanation about why we put this into the code or to the application material. Since I think this is very same in principle with, with what is required for the auditor's report. That's my comment. If I'm uh, wrong, sorry for that. Thank you. Um, could I ask a clarification? I didn't understand that last part about the auditor's report and confidentiality. Okay. Oh, oh sorry, sorry, sorry. My, I point out uh, the wrong slide, the slide 12, not, not slide 13. So, sorry, sorry about that. 113.3A1. Okay. Sorry, sorry for that. You may maybe need to restate your your question there, Meng. Oh, my just uh, just very uh, a quick suggestion because I think it's uh, not very direct link to to the uh, digital age or the technology application. It's I think it's a general uh, principle to uh, to the report from the auditors or the yeah or the yes so. so so, so, so I think I understand all... what you're saying now. Yes, thank you. Yeah, so the point, one thing we have to be careful about is, remember 113.3a1 is underneath one R113.3. And, and this is in a, you know, this is in the very, um, this is very much in the uh, application of the, the um, concept that says, 
where appropriate, a professional accountant shall make clients, the employee and organization, or other users, the accountant's information, service, or activity aware of uh, inher limitations inherent. And as I think as we looked at this as a task force, we, we didn't see the issues of the activity or service, whether it was technology or not, um, being any less important to communicate, even if it was in another area under R113.3. But we did think it was important to the point because of the technology to, uh, in my words, introduce a threshold that would help in terms of application material, help the accountant understand the importance of this by, by bringing in the reasonable and third form third party test. That, that was what we were intending uh, in, in that it, it's, it's not just applicable to technology, um, but it's applicable to any time you're trying to comply with that requirement in 113.3. If that if that perhaps helps, um, and I, and I think that's another. You raised this. You, your prior comment raised a similar comment. The, as the task force went through this and looked at it, as we looked at the circumstances that came up with technology, the areas we tried to add were uh, we got some feedback in prior uh, in some prior sessions and from some of our stakeholders that just. Uh, I hate, I'm going to say it in very blunt terms, just throwing in the word technology wasn't valuable, that it was more important to build on the, the, um, on the extant code uh, and consider it on a pr more principled basis. And so um, I, I hear you and we, can, we will continue to think through that. And that I'm sure is going to be part of the discussion with the board, but there was a rationale behind why sometimes the word technology doesn't appear specifically in a couple of these proposed amendments. Okay, uh, Hilda, you had uh, your hand raised. Thank you, Galen. Um, and thank you for the presentation. Um, I, I would first like to, to go back a little bit. So. The project about technology, uh, we uh, were uh, until now uh, more focused on, I would say, new technologies and the impact of that and, and the uh, non-authoritative uh, material that uh, uh, the group of Brian uh, is preparing. And overall, uh, we're supportive of that. That's maybe why we didn't comment to you, Brian, earlier. Uh, now, this is the kind of second phase, which, you know, we were obviously aware was coming. Um, now that uh, we see it, um, I think it's fair to say that we're a bit overwhelmed and we see a lot of additions um, coming and we didn't expect that. Maybe it's because we were expecting matters more focused on technology and this has indeed taken a much wider remit now. So maybe it's mislabeled, but still, if we look at all the additions that are now being proposed and, and we, we stand back, we are really wondering, uh, you know, does this all fit where they have been put uh, or all those additions uh, really needed? And uh, last but not least, when you look at that, you obviously want to be sure that uh, practitioners that will need to uh, use this and, and apply this, that they will be helped uh, by what is being added. And uh, there uh, we, we hesitate. Uh, we are really trying to see, is this going to really help or is most of this really going to help for practitioners in practice to, to, to do their work and to be cognizant of, you know, developments that uh, they should, uh, you know, take into consideration technology driven and potentially uh, driven uh, uh, by other um, considerations. So we're missing a little bit like that somebody has done this stand back test to see is this really what uh, we should be changing to the code here because these are a lot of additions and a lot of changes that would come from this. Um, that's an overall comment for, for, for this part of the project. One specific comment, and it is 
on the additions to section 120.6, where it's referred to as factors. We thought it was more maybe uh, circumstances, but up uh, uh, to you uh, to consider. Thank you. Okay. So um, I will tell you that's, that's an, uh, your observation uh, I think, in fact, you may have shared some of that at the prior uh, CAG, and uh, we have looked at that. If you actually compare the draft we have here, it is dramatically less edits than was in earlier over the last 12 months versions for the very reason um, um, uh, you pointed out, Hilda, that we were, we were trying to focus just on those areas that, you know, for example, that last one, if I'm required to explain that nature of the services and activity and inherent limitations. What do I? What guidance did it give me on how to do that? That's where we put the reasonable informed third party test in. Um, as we looked at the factors on technology, that was again trying to help specific to technology. But there, you know, and even the complexity section, um, you know, there were there have been there are other stakeholders who would have suggested that should be dramatically longer. And so there has there has been an attempt to balance that. So I want to I want to tell you we have thought about what you said from a step back look back. Um, I I guess I can appreciate that it may may perceive to be more in the parts one through three than than some had expected coming out of technology. But it's actually dramatically skinny down if you go back and look at the December of twenty, March and June of twenty one documents. Um, but we continue to look at that and that I'm sure will also be an important consideration as we talk with the uh, uh, with the full board at the upcoming meetings. Rich, uh, I wonder whether I could just add something to that. Please, Richard. Uh, if you'll forgive me. Hilda, um, I think one of the things that uh, is important to remember is that we started this project from a set of recommendations from the previous task force. And uh, each of these uh, has their origin in a specific rec uh, recommendation. Uh, in fact, not every recommendation has been followed through for much for the reasons that you've mentioned. And as Rich has just said, we've trimmed back quite considerably uh, since the draft that went to the June-July board uh, for consideration in the light of the comments that we received uh, from board members and indeed from the CAG earlier on in the year. Uh, things like 120.6A5 is responsive to board members saying, well, it's all very well saying do something, but there's no guidance or help to tell practitioners how to do it. And as Rich has tried to explain or has explained, that's what paragraphs like this are trying to respond to. So we're somewhat between a range of different um, propositions in this, or positions in the sense that we've got a set of recommendations which um, met with a number of comments that range from there's too much to there's not enough. So we're, there's a balance to be struck. And all I'm trying to emphasize is that we've been very conscious of that as we've tried to develop this to this particular stage. Rich, I hope that's... No, pre, no very, very helpful, Richard. Thank you. Uh, I see uh, Conchita. Well, let's uh, give it a go again there, Conchita. Thank you. If I get disconnected again, I sent an email to, to Jeff. But basically, uh, I agree with the with what has been said, and perhaps uh, the the coverage of technology is really overwhelming, and there will be a lot of learnings and education that should be given, even among. Uh, I would say practicing professional, professional accountants. My take is perhaps while the approach is principles based, 
we need to clearly define expectations. Otherwise, we don't know uh, what will be the coverage. Now, if I may recall, let me be more specific uh, to cite an example. Years, I mean, some time ago, XBRL was presented to us. Uh, those of you who have been in the CAG for some time. What do we do about it? It has been uh, enhanced and adopted in the US and in Europe. What is the take of the standard setters on the adoption of XBRL, which is actually technology driven? The traditional uh, reports by PIs uh, have changed a lot. And what's the take of the standard setters? That is a specific reference point that I would like to cite. Um, I am just uh, expressing my, my insights and this will require a lot of enormous, I mean, it's, it's the enormity of the work involved is such that indeed it is overwhelming. Perhaps uh, let's simplify and uh, maybe structure it in such a way that it will not be all inclusive because it cannot be all inclusive. The changes are rapid and robust. So uh, just my take, I may be wrong, but day-to-day uh, -day it is changing. Thank you. Rich, I don't see any other hands raised. Did, did you want to respond? Well, I, th I think further. Um, Conchita's point is important. One of the things we have thought about a lot here is that there's probably technology issues that will arise two or three years out that have not been of significant focus. And that's why the principles-based approach in the code is so important. But it's also why you know, the importance of the efforts of the working group and all of the outreach that's being done there to A, st st identify the trends, B, there are, you know, that Brian spent some time talking about the recent uh, session with the, uh, in Saudi Arabia that I sat through that. Um, there was unequivocally an educational element to that session. And I think that's an important part of what the, the working group's going to be dealing with is that it's a two-way street. It's not just learning for uh, the purposes of the, of the standard setters, but it's also for purposes of developing materials that uh, educate and drive the profession. Uh, because I think your example is a good one. XBRL is kind of a, you know, today you think about it and say, oh yeah, it's out there where people use it as appropriate and we've, we've mastered it, so to speak. Um, but, you know, there's other technologies that are emerging that I would tell you we haven't begun to see what the potential extent of that is. And so we've tried to write the code. Uh, and, and I think, Conchita, your point would be we need to stay on top of that as a profession and constantly be reminding the professional accountants in business and in practice of the developments and how they should think about those uh, and when necessary, how to tie those back to the principles in the code. Um, Galen, perhaps we should move to uh, um, part 4A of the code? Yes, yes, please do. Yep. Yeah. Okay, so um, um, this is again is a summary slide of what you're going to see in a bit more detail. Um, we have, uh, I would say overall, um, you're going to see that the um, there is for significant further restriction, restricting the, the types of activities and services that an auditor could provide, uh, frankly, in the IT area. In fact, it's, it's largely, um, for PIs, um, large, largely eliminated if it has anything to do with, with the internal controls over financial reporting 
um, or on the financial accounting records or financial statements. That is not just a, because of this proposed standard, but it is in combination with the important work that was done by the uh, NAS project. Um, we do address some things related to sale and licensing and technology. Uh, we do address some uh, characteristics about the importance of considering whether you're assuming a management responsibility. Um, we make a very important point. We actually make it twice. Um, and, um, and I'll show you that in a little bit, that uh, when you are providing some technology, using technology or providing technology to a, a client, you need to take into consideration the consideration, the use of NAS around the permissibility of that service. Um, that was something that uh, we pointed out to the CAG. We had spotted in the survey that there was uh, a portion of the respondents, I think it was just shy of a quarter, who seemed to believe that that was not necessarily the case. And so we've been taking pains to reiterate that. Um, and then we've expanded and, and provided the examples of IT services that might create a self-review threat, um, including, uh, including a prohibition on, and then also included a prohibition on hosting services. So um, I forget who raised the question about hosting to Brian, uh, but the reality is uh, there's probably, uh, as it relates to um, professional accountants in practice, there's probably not a lot, if this goes through, would not be a lot of need for NAM since it's not permitted, going to be permitted going forward. So with that, let's move to the next slide. Uh, this addressed um, some, some clarification that uh, whenever technology is used, you, can, you need to consider whether you're complying with the requirements of 413 and 414 to um, ensure that you have not assumed a management responsibility and feel this is a fairly important point. Um, we, with technology, things that used to look like they were, for example, compliance oriented can very quickly move into helping make the decision on the next step, which gets into management responsibility. Um, and it, this concept applies not just if it's solely provided by technology, but obviously if you're providing other activities or services um, that use technology for a portion of them. Um, in terms of business relationships uh, and, and what's a close business relationship subject to the business relationship rules, um, we've made some uh, clarifications to the existing example by uh, uh, inserting the word cells in two places to make it clear that um, um, that would be uh, subject to the business relationship rules. Um, and secondly, we've added another, a fourth example, though, for those who are familiar with 523, there are, there are uh, three existing examples. This is the fourth uh, to address situations where there has been some kind of joint development with an audit client and products or solutions, which one or both parties sells or license to third parties are now would be subject to the independence limitations. Um, by the way, in, you know, as I go through 4A, be aware that corresponding changes uh, to 4B have been made. So the section 900, 920, 950, um, we're only gonna, when we get to the later part of the survey, the, the slides, I'm only gonna cover things that aren't already addressed in 4A and are just um, duplicated over. Um, as I said a few minutes ago, you may recall that, uh, as I said, the, the, the survey indicated there were some people didn't believe you had to consider the NAS requirements. And so additions are being made to both 520 and to 600 to make it clear that um, the use of technology always requires you to consider uh, the NAS prohibitions and requirements. And then one of the things that uh, NAS had addressed uh, provided some additional clarification, we moved to the next slide on routine and mechanical. Um, and uh, uh, 601 5A1 
has historically pointed out that there's re requires little or no professional judgment. Um, this, this remember that the activities that would services would be covered under 601.5 are already prohibited by NAS for pies. So this proposal here uh, is largely impacting non pies and there is some application material at it as a two that points out that uh, just because the service is automated doesn't mean it's routine or mechanical. Um, and there was some feedback from various stakeholders over time that that was sometimes a misconception that was out there. Uh, and you need to consider factions in terms of fun factors in terms of how the technology functions and whether the technology uses expertise or judgments attributable to the firm or network firm, because that would be not routine and mechanical. Then moving to 606, um, we start out by clarifying in the front section, uh, the breadth of what is considered IT service system services. So 606-2A1 has uh, the addition shown on this slide. Um, that includes implement, <coughs> develop, design and development, implementation, and which includes not just installation, but configuring, interfacing, or customizing. It also includes ongoing things after the software is in place, operating, maintaining, monitoring, or update IT systems, and then collecting or storing data as specific service or managing the hosting of the data. Uh, and why it says directly or indirectly is because in today's world, even since maybe before this project got started, the growth of the use of cloud, um, much of data we see is stored in the cloud, but it's not appropriate for, you, you know, having an obligation to help manage that service, um, uh, even though the storage is indirect on somebody else's system is still subject to consideration. Uh, in 606. <clears throat> and then we, we address specifically uh, hosting as an example of, um, of something that would involve a, a, a prohibition on assumption of management responsibility. Um, and that's what 606.3a1 puts in place as a prohibition. This was something that some of our outreach with regulators was actually very helpful. Uh, particularly our outreach with the CAOB, they confirmed some of our thinking around this um, and, and provided some thoughtful input. And that was and that, that's a good example where stakeholder outreach had helped, conf, you know, helped us direct and confirm what we want, we believed. But we do distinguish one thing here, and this was very important. We got a lot of feedback from various parties. There is a difference between hosting the client's data. And what I'll say is using the data to provide what is an existing permitted service. And the common example of 606, that 606.3A2 is addressing is the client has its books and records, it closes its books and records, now it has to file a tax return. Tax compliance is currently is permitted under the sections of 600 as a permissible NAS. They may transmit the data to you and you may use that in a tool, technology tool that best um, uh, combines and, 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 and presents the material as appropriate under existing tax statutes to file the, compare the return. Having that data, which the client has the original of on your, on your source is not what we mean by prohibited hosting. That, that is permissible um, because it does not result in the assumption of management responsibility. They in fact have the data are responsible for it and simply provide it to you for you to provide a permitted service. And then we addressed off the shelf uh, software. And uh, first of all, there had been uh, in the extant code examples of situations uh, of IT system services do, that do not usually create a threat. And one of those was implementing off the shelf software or financial information reporting uh, software that was not developed by the firm or network firm if the customization required to client's needs is not significant. That has been removed as a presumption is the proposal. Um, that does not mean that for, for it, it, it's not subject to assessment as a threat and for non-PIs, um, particularly if we move to the next slide, 
Um, we do think that that you could, there is still in the code, we've left in the extant code, considerations of whether certain safeguards could um, address that. But we point out that the, uh, that this, doing this for a pie might create a self-review threat. And as you know, from the NAS service, self-review threats are prohibited for all PI audit clients that might create a self-review threat. Um, and so that's, that summarizes what we did with off the shelf. Um, and then we, as I mentioned in the lead into this section, we expanded our discussion uh, of examples that might create a self-review threat uh by adding 606a excuse me 6064a4 and we have put in some very specific examples that mirror very closely uh the very first section i talked about which is just in nature what's the nature of the services might provide um and and obviously uh developing implementing operating maintaining uh, or updating systems uh, might create a self-review threat um, you can see similar providing or maintaining network security, business continuity, or disaster recovery. Um, uh, and and um, supporting IT system or network performance, for example, are all examples that have been added. And obviously, self-review threats are prohibited for PIs. So in general, you will uh, if you note that there is, um, I guess, in plain English, significantly uh, tightening and, and uh, of, uh, of what's permitted and frankly, elimination of, of many areas that previously may have been permitted between what NAS did with materiality and self-review threat and the expansive examples that have been added here in 606. So with that, um, I would, uh, Galen, uh, ask for a comment. Yeah. So comments from the uh, the representatives, please, and observers. So, uh, Rich, the the whole notion of off the shelf are we removing that phraseology in the in the proposed changes? No, we just removed it from the section that says it's a presumptive not uh, okay. presumptively not creating. A threat, and uh, as I said, that it it's now for a pie, something that or non-pie, something that you would have to assess the threats. There is a safeguard that is still in this extent. It's in the extent code, and it's not amended, proposed to be amended by our efforts. Uh, that there could be situations where uh, you could still do that, but for pies, um, it would it would fall within what we believe is is um, something that might create a self-review threat and would be prohibited. Is, is is off the shelf actually defined as such? We do not do that. Um, in the discussions we've had, we have not seen many people find find or provide an example of what is truly off, off the shelf. The only reference we can see is um, some what I'll call bookkeeping packages that you could literally put on a laptop. Yeah. Um, and while there are businesses that that may still be appropriate for, we certainly um, as a group would not think that we'd think that a company, particularly a larger entities, that would be really unrealistic. And most of the implementation and installations you see these days involve uh, a degree of customization to them. Yeah, I, I, I would think so. I would think that off shelf, when I think of it, I think of going into a retail store and seeing, you know, boxes sitting there, but, you know, maybe that isn't how yeah, I, folks think of it anymore. Yeah, I, I think we would, I would, add, you know, I get, that's how it started out, Gail, and I totally agree with that. But I think you have to recognize today, it's, it's a matter of, I go to a software provider, I buy their package intact and, you know, in, put it in. And the point is, we don't see many packages involving financial systems or internal controls over financial systems that just get brought down and connected through uh, with, without um, the need to 
do other things that are important to making it function and that impact on the internal controls, certainly, if not the actual uh, accounting system. I see uh, Hilda is her, her hand up. Hilda. Thank you, Galen. As um, referencing to um, hosting seems to be popular this afternoon, could I ask a question about that? It was referred to, and um, as far as we understand, you know, hosting, uh, it's a management uh, responsibility. Now, if you look to the NAS prohibition, then there is a reference basically only to the subject matter or the subject matter information for the assurance report. And if you then take this back to hosting, um, what does that mean? Does that mean uh, that you can uh, only do no hosting if it has to do with the subject matter information, the hosting, or you know, how should you understand this? How, how does this work yeah. uh, more widely in, in what is being proposed? So, I have to admit, we were not clear on that. So that's an example of how, when we looked at that, we were questioning, wow, how you would interpret this in practice? Is this really clear here? Question mark. So you're, you're asking about when we get to section 900, et cetera, where it applies to assurance services? Uh, yes. Yeah, I think the intent is that you should not have involvement with the material that is, constitutes the subject matter in which you will provide an attestation. And so that would include hosting, but we can certainly look at whether that's been made as clear as possible. And uh, So essentially it would not be permitted, Hilda, to, to, to put it in the words you asked about. I see Jim Dawkin has his hand raised. Jim. Yeah, I, Jim, go ahead. If you can hear me, I'm, I think you're on mute though. Sorry, Galen, I was, um, I just had a question on the management responsibility and maybe it's it's elsewhere in the code, but you know what uh, represents management taking responsibility so if there's just a document sign that that you know hey management has responsibility is that sufficient, or is it more of a facts and circumstances. Because uh, I think oftentimes when the when the data is maintained by the auditors or the accountants, um, management will say, well, it's, it's not ours. It's, you know, it's, it's, it's being held by the, the audit firm. Um, we don't really know, but yet there's a document that says they take responsibility. How, how is that issue um, resolved? Are you referring to in the context of hosting, Jim? Yeah. Yeah, okay. So first of all, 413 and 414 in the extant code uh, outline management's responsibilities and um, um, the activities that the, the firm uh, or network firm should be satisfied that the client takes as it relates to uh, applying with those. The issue with hosting, again, if you are the primary host of the client's data, they don't have access to it. Um, you know that that see, you know even though they signed a document that says I agree that you can I've contracted you to host this, um, that seems inconsistent with the uh, ability the responsibility of management under thirteen, and that's largely driving the view that it should not be permitted. In the cases where, I, and again, my example is tax, there, there could be others, but we see this more, we, we understand from stakeholders and our experiences that we see this more commonly in the tax space. I have my books and records, I give it to you, you have software that makes it fit the return that I must file in country X. Again, it's, it's just uh, recasting that information to comply uh, with the reporting requirements for the return filing, 
the information is still the clients, they still hold it and maintain it. Yes, you may have that in the system and you may have that for more than one year because there are reasons one wants to see, have that comparative information available. But when you file the return, you also give a copy of the return to the client. Actually, they sign it and, and file it in most jurisdictions or electronically transmit it more increasingly is what we see. And so that's, a, that's not what we're trying to, we're saying is inappropriate. But one of the things that I just put this in context of, of, of uh, the hosting is that, you know, there appeared to be from some of the feedback we were getting a view that it was okay to host your clients' primary systems or something that related to their execution of controls, for example. And, and that was where um, it was believed that that would, it's inconsistent with 413 and 14 and, and, uh, uh, and the prohibition on assuming management responsibility. So I, I don't think that just them signing a document that says I took responsibility and here you go deal with it is, is uh, avoids the prohibition that has been put in place here. Rich. I don't know if that's consistent with your thinking, Jim, of what we would the objective should be or not, but that, that that's just what how we I would explain what we were trying to do. Rich, some firms have portals where they they retain financial statements, the authenticity authenticity of the underlying financial statements and and access to those. Uh, the client also has a copy of the financial statements. Uh, would that be considered hosting? Yeah, Galen, I, I think, I think it, um, it, it may not be hosting, but I think you have to consider the nature of the specific situation as to who might access and get that information. Um, um, I, I'm familiar with variations of that as you describe it. Uh, again, if it, if it, the client uh, has, has, there are some jurisdictions that that's actually required, um, for certain types of financial statements, as I understand it. But, uh, so I was, we would not have thought that that was inconsistent with Ness. I would not have thought that's necessarily inconsistent with, or assuming management responsibility, but I think you have to look at the facts and circumstances of what's being done and why, and in the con the broader context of legal regulatory requirements, et cetera. Yeah, I was thinking in terms of just uh, public interest protection. You have people that can mark up financial statements and fraudulently, yeah, we you know put them out there, and and it it would seem to me that that well that that the task force maybe it doesn't go in the standard, but would maybe at least think about that and, and perhaps it's an exception. Yeah, I, I understand that. I, I think we, we've all seen that. We've all seen, you know, opinions taken off of auditor opinions taken off of one report and put on another one electronically. So um, I think those things that are designed to be in the public interest, and generally that means it's the client's records, they've already determined the appropriateness of whatever it is. Um, I think things that are designed to just appropriately protect those things were not what we were after here. It's, it's really um, the responsibility for hosting. Um, and one of the things that some of our stakeholders pointed out when we thought about hosting was, well, we have it under management responsibility. The minute something goes wrong with the hosting, it's almost impossible for the host not to be involved in the reconstruction or the correction of the problem. And that immediately gets you into a self-review problem. Um, and so um, that, that's another thought that we've had as to why this should be uh, not permitted. Yeah. Well, Rich, I don't see any other questions or any hands raised. So uh, you want to continue? So I'll, just, I'll just quickly cover a couple of the slides on part B here real quick. Um, we did incorporate the concept of non-financial. There, there was already some material in part B, 4B addressing um, it was very narrow, but it addressed a certain aspect of sustainability. We didn't eliminate that phrase as it relates to greenhouse gas, but we expanded it to point out that it's non-financials and ex information uh, could be covered uh, under 900.1. 
Uh, an example is ES, environmental and sustainability disclosures. And then we left the, the, a more specific example on that. Um, on the next slide, <clears throat> Um, this is the point that I, I think Hilda asked about in 950.10 A1 or where we try to address it, A1C, uh, that if you're going to provide assurance on information that you as the uh, party that's going to attest have been involved in the design development, implementation, maintenance operations, uh, um, that that would not be um, um, consistent and that there would be a self-review threat. Um, as a result of that consistent with what it would be if it was a financial system. Uh, and so this could apply to non-financial as well as to other financial information for which a test station could be provided. Um, and then um, the following slide addresses that where we've incorporated items from part 4A into part 4B for consistency. So the hosting point we talked about management responsibility, the close business relationships and the sale and life, including sale and licensing. So with that, um, certainly um, we'll go to the next slide, please, Cam. Um, we have an um, uh, important meeting coming up. We need to consider the input here from the CAG as well as what we get from the board. We have a four specific scheduled outreaches, but I can tell you we are trying to um, 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 ident pick up a couple others, and one of which um, um, uh, we've identified, uh, Jens Pauls helped us identify a group just the other day uh, in Europe that's involved with uh, uh, corporate, uh, those charged with governance that we're, we, so we have some additional outreach out there, but we don't have those firm dates scheduled with parties at this point. Um, and, um, and with that, um, I will, uh, there's a pause for any final comments, uh, questions from the group. Rich, I don't see any, any further hands. Uh, what did you have any, I guess that's your closing remarks. I, I would just say thank you for the input. It's okay. always valuable. It was valuable in the last meeting. This meeting was also valuable to hear the thoughts and that, and um, and all those things are are considered uh, will be considered by the task force. Okay, uh, Stavros, would you have have any anything you might want to add? Yes. Yes, thank you very much. Uh, I thought that this has been a very rich discussion. And of course, we are preparing to deliver an exposure draft in December. And that, as you all know, is the major test with stakeholders. Uh, the uh, two elements I take with me, besides what uh, Rich has already said is that uh, we have, as we move towards the exposure draft, we clearly have to be careful uh, about two, two balances. One is the balance of stakeholders that will feed into our effort at this point. And I believe that uh, uh, Rich has uh, positioned himself on that. The other is this balance on whether we have important enough complementary material to our previous work or unimportant supplements. Uh, I'm referring mainly to what Hilda was uh, articulating. And this is a balance we have to keep in mind as we move to the final stage for the exposure draft. But clearly these issues will be revisited also after the exposure draft. So um, that's all I wanted to note at this point. And I really want to uh, thank all of you and many of you that have um, provided valuable comment. I do see, thank you, Stavros. I do see a couple other hands that have since gone up. Uh, Ken Siang. Uh, Gillen, I, I, if I might suggest, I'd ask uh, Akihito to go first because uh, I have okay. a oh, more general comment. Yes, yes, fine. Akihito? Thank you. Sorry for late. 
Uh, thank you. Thank you very much for your clear and detailed explanations. It is very helpful for me to catch up the status and to understand this topic deeply. Uh, let me share uh, two overall uh, comments, observations uh, with you. Uh, the first point uh, regarding the revision to the ISPA code of uh, technology, uh, I think that it is very important to keep in mind the consistency with ISA 500. It is the ongoing project and the guidance of technology uh, will be included in ISA 500. We should take care to uh, ensure uh, alignment, uh, including terminology and wording. And the second point, uh, sorry, may, maybe going back to the first agenda. Uh, in my view, uh, guidance and non authoritative materials uh, on technology for the future are uh, important, I think. Uh, on the other hand, uh, the current situation, uh, ongoing changes, for example, uh, digitalization and uh, remote auditing due to uh, COVID-19, uh, where the authenticity of uh, audit evidence is a key point. And they are updated quickly and it is important too to pay attention and keep up with uh, such changes, I think. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Akihiro. Uh, and then uh, I see Jas Jasmine uh, has raised her hand. Jasmine, you go ahead, please. Hi there. Thank you for the great presentation and all of the work that has gone into the project. Regarding section 900.1 assurance engagements, other than audit engagements, I was very pleased to see mention of assurance over non-financial information, such as environmental and sustainability disclosures called out as an example. As we know, the scope of technology used in these engagements is quickly expanding. My feedback is that um, I, I really think it'll be critical that ESG-related engagements continue being an area monitored by the task force as assurance around these metrics evolves. Thank you. Uh, and uh, Rich, would you like to respond to either of those comments before we move forward? Uh, no, I think I think uh, um, you know, um, the comment on uh, conforming with the terminology and wording and staying close to the ISA 500 is absolutely uh, consistent with our intention. Um, and that was, uh, uh, I think, Jasmine, the reason we put 901 in is because this is a growing area and we want it to be clear. And while we used ESG as an example, there is other non-financial assurance that we see in the marketplace potentially expanding. And we wanted to have that in broadly uh, to address what might arise in the future and make it clear that this section applies to that. So, um, and I think that can be also a source as you point out for non-authoritative material as things evolve. So appreciate that comment. Thanks, thanks, Rich and Ken. Now we can, I think, go to you. Yeah, briefly, Ken, and, and, I, and uh, sorry, I had to drop off briefly, but I, uh, and I wasn't sure you, you, you'd um, mention this to the CAG. Uh, as we know, the PIUB has uh, encouraged our board to reach out to as board a, a range of constituencies as, as possible to obtain input on our in particular on our technology project. Uh, Rich spoke to a number of outreach uh, engagements we, we um, are, are committing to or have committed to in the fourth quarter. So we're doing our best to really reach out to um, really stakeholders beyond, beyond just firms or professional accountancy organizations. So really obtaining, obtaining feedback beyond, beyond the, uh, the immediate perimeter of, of the profession. And I'd encourage the CAG in that context then, um, you know, all the, all the representatives, um, it, uh, as we look ahead to the exposure draft uh, being issued hopefully early in the new year following uh, board consideration and approval in December, uh, if you're able to encourage your organization um, uh, it, it really to look into the exposure draft, uh, consider it um, uh, and, uh, review it in terms of, uh, you know, uh, 
what is being proposed and uh, how it might <clears throat> uh, potentially have, have um, uh, implications or modifications, uh, at least from your perspectives, I think that'd be very useful. Uh, in the past, we have uh, received, I know, comments from, uh, for example, uh, you know, some, some member organizations in the CAG, <clears throat> the Basel Committee, the GAO, uh, and others. So to the extent we are able to really um, have a broad engagement from the CAG in that regard, I think that'd be very useful uh, for purposes of our project. Thank you. Thank you, Ken. And Dr. Chen, uh, uh, any any feedback that we can receive from you on the entire session today, or uh, or on this past session? Your comments, please. Thank you, chair. Thank you, chairman. So uh, I'm happy to uh, you know to complete the observation of the whole session today. Uh, with regard to the technology project, as is stated in the PIOB document the public interest issues published last month, that the use and the impacts of technology is one of the most important issues the profession will face in the current decade. Also, the pervasive nature of technology and its broad and the, and the exploitation which it, which it is in the public interest for the ISBA to address in a comprehensive and a timely manner. COVID-19 effects and the accelerated adopt adoption and the development of technology, additional reasons for urgency. Such you know, uh, explanation may be you know, cited by, you, by you everyone. So based on my observation, I would commend you that both the projects or initiatives say, non-authoritative material and uh, phase fund, tax funding and technology being progressing well forward. At this moment, no public interest issues raised at this stage in relation to the NAM initiative, given that the working group is at the initial stage of its work. As far as the proposed proposal to establish technology but the rather committee, it seems an in, a very a interesting approach. Well, there is the opportunity to obtain external experts in the area that is in constant development, addressing the concern raised by the PIOB in relation to the technology project. And the need to broaden access should be considered with caution ensuring that the remit of the group is clearly articulated to avoid undue influence of the accounting profession in materials developed by ISBA or even WSB, and that a broad or relevant range of stakeholders are present in the committee. With regard to the technology project, the current proposals presented by the TF, especially specifically the explicit recognition that the sale or licensing of technology services to audit clients might create threats and that in such circumstances, NAS requirements would apply are a positive response to address independent issues. They are in line with the PIOB's public interest issue previously raised. So just, that's just what I, would like to come to comment. So thank you. Thank you, Dr. Chen, uh, for Please. for the, for that. Yeah. Uh, I um, I'd like to thank all of the representatives for their involvement, a robust discussion today, and to remind you that uh, tomorrow, uh, September eighth, at uh, seven seven a.m. Eastern Standard Time, we will have a joint session with the IAASB CAG on the public interest entity uh, definition and listed uh, entity, or yeah, yes, and the listed entities. And, and so that will be our, our next uh, event here, uh, followed by our final session, which will be on uh, September 20th. And with that, I, I think I'll bring the, uh, the meeting to a close. Thank you very much.
Thank you, Ron. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. See you tomorrow.